Hello all. Hello. Sure about a slightly late start, but <laughs> it's one of those things. You get back from family event, uh, family things, and you're not, you have a weekend without the family stuff, and you're dealing with and you know the Christmas season and all that stuff. And I have got emails. I have just realised. I've been working through emails. I have about a hundred emails still to go from before Christmas, because I just got so many. Mostly, I would say, thinly veiled as Christmas greetings or New Year's greetings uh, requests for extensions <laughs> on various papers. And uh, what I found funny is most of my coursework, because I work it out quite sensibly, is not due till March. And you are asking for an extension in December. I'm sorry, but the blanket answer will be in December for asking for an extension on a deadline, which is already March, which is for an essay. No. And in January, when I respond to the message in December, it will still be no. If you need an extension in March, I will consider things. But, considering you have till pretty much nearly the end of March for it, because I have this desire to not be doing marking at a certain period in March, so I structure it accordingly within the permits of the university, then, please, do not ask for an extension in December and January. You won't get one. And every year it is the same. <laughs> Sorry, I could have got 15 minutes or more minutes of sleep. Yeah, well, they only allow you to put it at 7 o'clock or 7.15 as a starting timing. So, I am... Um, if I want 5 minutes more, I have to put it back to 7.15. Hello everyone, how are we doing today? Oh, hello Carl McGaspick, hello Peter Dawson, hello Dan Freeman, hello Summary History, hello Mark Harkness, hello Jack Ray, hello Megascro, hello Macooch, hello George Newman, hello Idris Verdun, hello Albazaski, hello M35 Benvids, History Vanguard, hello, hello Mr. Serenity's End, hello Manly1640, hello Tanaferka, hello DG40, hello Just B, hello! And Seneca Nero, hello, and Barner and Neyman, hello. The Fluffy Research Assistant is not with me. It is raining and has been snowing today. The Fluffy Research Assistants, both of them. Well, one of them is banned from going in the garden because even though it's raining, he decided he wanted to try and go for a swim in the pond. And the other one just did the quickest about turn on the steps you will ever have seen a dog do in their entire life. Managed to go out and... Turn around, get back in, and cock on a potted tree while his front half was in the house. That takes skill. That takes skill. So, no, Pro Move is asking for an extension the day the essay is assigned. You <laughs> that, you won't get an extension if you ask for one on the dates of June. Uh. Now, so what auxiliary ships do not get enough praise for what they did in the Model 1 or Model 2? Try to find a single... How do I put this? Mainly because it would just add another book to the list of books I have to write, and I'm already working on about a dozen and writing four at the moment, or in various stages of writing four and working on a dozen more plans. Um, there is not a decent book out there about naval tenders. Uh, you know, the supply and maintenance ships that basically keep their flotillas, submarines, and destroyers going. There is, there are patchy books, right? I mean, there are individually good books, which are usually about individual ships. That's great, 
But for tenders as a whole, for the whole wider discussion of the ships, no, there's not a good all-encompassing allied tender book. Um, there's some which make a stab at it, but they're not good. No good ones. Oilers. Done. Honestly, it's bad enough trying to get some decent books about the smaller ships in World War Two and World War One, let alone the auxiliary ships and the other vessels which backed them up. Yes, they were asking for an extension in December for a March deadline. One of those actual this means is that actual genuine happy Christmas me emails which I've received, I have not managed to find and yet got to. I've still got about a thousand, I think, left to go, or at least a couple of hundred. It depends on whether I bother with one of my other email accounts or not. Don't know, I only once ever asked for an extension, and that was because I was shivering aching mess due to flu. You would get it under those circumstances. I'm not a... This is the thing I find strange. I'm not cruel and unusual punishment. I do actually give extensions, and as a rule, my, ex my essays are usually it's a case of, here is the topics, the questions are given out at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the semester, uh, of semester one, and you will have to submit this halfway through semester two. Because it's a full year course. So enjoy. Go away. Write. Be happy. Carefully structured so that it's between all the assignments which are due for the first semester, which are due by the end of usually January. And all the assignments which are due for semester two, which are May, June, usually in terms of their dating. So, yeah. End of March. Your papers are due. You will have, therefore, you get the assignments set, the questions set, in September. Probably you don't read them till about week two, week three of September. Let's say it's October. So, October, November, December, March... December, January, February, March. Yep, broadly speaking, October, November, December, January, February, March. Six months. And as I've said before, on thing, I think when I'm putting out the questions the other day, it's usually a case of here are do go away, do free assignments. The two highest ones will get averaged as your coursework grade. Go have fun. Usually three to four thousand word essays. You have months to go write them. So anyway, if the US had pigeon guided munitions in nineteen forty two in widespread use, how does that change the war? I'm just going to check that this is pigeon, not precision, right? So it's pigeon. Okay. If they have pigeon-guided munitions, A, their pigeon breeding is suddenly going to be an incredibly important and possibly protected um, category from being called up. Uh, two... You're going to make World War II look like an episode of Crusader Kings 3 when you're trying to defend against everyone coming and taking the Kingdom of England in 1066. Which, by the way, I, I do not for the life of me. Mainly because it doesn't allow me to raise a frigating navy. Um, to understand how you're supposed to win that. I can usually do fairly well in Crusader Kings, but on that... For some reason, on that one, every time I try it, I get massacred. 
I'm not sure whether it's the fact that I'm playing it on a level at which the AI just seems to spam troops or what goes on, but, you know. But, no, seriously, Pigeon Guided Munitions, that's going to have a fun effect. More on Europe, probably, than... Well, it depends. How does the how accurate is the pigeon guidance system, and how long range can you make it? Because if you can get rocket technology to level, you can launch pigeon guided munitions across the Pacific. Well, that could really, really change things. Thank you, Fushi. That's Aaron. If the Invincible Class CVLH Harcrawl had has was converted into a hospital ship, how long would the Iron keep her in the role, and what would you replace her? She'd probably depends when they're converting her. If they converted her after she was retired, so let's see. If R07, which was retired in, well, decommissioned in 2011, was converted into a hospital ship, she'd probably still be in service as a hospital ship now. What they'd be doing with her, who knows, but they'd be probably converted into a hospital ship, they'd probably use her in a hospital ship now. If it's in the 1980s, then... I would say New Labour would find a reason to get rid of her. They might replace her, though. They might replace her. It might be a case of they get rid of her and the Royal Yacht and then replace it with something that will do both roles. Make sure tennis. Oh god, I'm having flashbacks here suddenly. The ship that tried to burn out from underneath me in the North Atlantic in January. Yeah, they're fun. Yeah, I was asking. Just finishing going through the Marrying Santa Marcia. That's very serious. And they looked at, then looked at King George V's. Why do King George V's look in fear in everything but speed and depredation contain the standards? Why? Because for power is expensive. Speed is expensive in displacement. Oh, Lord. HFNN, I'm sorry in advance, I'm thinking about to make a war spite an official cult and mechanicus. Although in naval circles, it probably already is. Uh, uh, life happens. Mr. how long would the timeline be for large port upgrade and expansion taken in the mid 19th century? So if we're talking about the 1850s, 60s, uh, if you're doing a major port upgrade, you could be talking two to three years' work. Depends, of always, how much money and you are prepared to put into it. If you're talking about something like Camelads or Liverpool Docks, where it's Britain and they have a lot of money and they have a lot of interest in upgrading them, you'd be surprised and amazed at how quickly they can get built. Uh, probably a brick lined rather than concrete and uh, dry dock, etc. But yes, it'd be built fairly quickly and fairly efficiently. But saying that, some places took a long time. If you were France, it could take the best part of a decade. Listen, pigeon guidance was visual range only, voting logic of free pigeons. Then... Honestly, that just makes things more confusing. But probably it's going to be interesting in Europe. It might provide them with a anti-tank weapon, which means they don't need dive bombers. Yeah. 
Enjoy Night 683, and that's quite fun, the complete record of all fighting ships of the Royal Navy from the 20th century to present day. Pigeons tapping screens. It wasn't there already something where the British used pigeons to gather intelligence through notes from the resistance, but they also put tags on the British pigeons so people didn't shoot German spy pigeons. There's all sorts of pigeon warfare going on. They were firm they were nuclear landmines warmed by chickens. If anyone wants to get a start to wonder just how crazy Cold War got, that's it. But just think, how crazy could a future Cold War get? Mm-hmm. It does always a beer skinner. It's one Carol Laird mentioned. Well, they're a good one to go for, and also then there's all the example is that you can give otherwise is Thames Ironworks down in London, and Thames Ironworks has a interesting history when it comes to British governments and funding. It's right. I've gone down a rabbit hole reading about a trans Victorious, aka U.S. Robert. Very interesting ship. Missing a mission to Pacific. Yeah. Jamie does a good work on her. Matthew, right. does the Royal Navy have any submarine tender ships? Yes, they have two, and are planning on retiring them, not replacing them. Royal Navy doesn't have any anymore. They used to have lots, but they don't have any anymore. Yeah, Pavlov's guided anti-tank dogs was not really a good idea in my mind. Not to my mind. It, it doesn't seem right. It really doesn't. In fact, honestly, it seems a little bit um, cruel and unusual. I was can you see Camel Air building a 100,000 ton aircraft carrier? If you give them the money to build the yard, they'll do it. In the nicest way, they're a pro it, This is a discussion I have with a fair number of people sometimes, where I get told by someone going, well, well, no, these people will not build this for, uh, for you. And you sit there and go, they're a private commercial company. If you offer them the money, they will build it. They're, what you mean is they will not build it for you for a reasonable price, and they aren't offering it already because they don't have the facilities to build it. But trust me, if you go to a defense contractor and you go, I would like this, and I will give you money for it, their usual answer is yes. And if they say don't say yes, then you just have to tell the shareholders that the board's on, a board is not acting in their best interests, and you will find a board which will say yes. It's one of the joyous things of a capitalist system. There is this theory that these boards have this power and can say no and decide what you get this way and that way. But they only can as long as you let them. Ah, I even got your patron post the essay. Glad it's good. Later on, was re re rereading Rebuilding the Royal Navy by Baron Moore? Had we had four Malters or two CVO go through and constantly get a full class of Type 2s, how much would they differ from Bristol as she appeared in real life? Um, not much difference from Bristol. 
and it would have been they would have been pretty much the same as Bristol. I honestly think if we'd had the Malters, the Bristols would have actually been slightly bigger. Many say before, defense contractors respond in 100% of cases positively to mention some money squared, or God forbid, cubic money. <laughs> that's, that's the point. Uh, you know, I was sitting in a meeting, oh, this must have been 2019. It was pre COVID, so it could have been early 2020, it could have been. 2019 and it wasn't Chatham House rules so I can talk about it but I can't really name names because then you don't get invited back again and we were discussing various defense procurement plans and there was something which we were considering procuring at the time which would have been very, very sensible to have had, now we have all the issues going on, which we actually might end up having to get anyway. And, um... One of the honest discussions, because this thing was going to be something which is going to be Davit mounted on the logistics ships we're discussing. They were sitting there going... The logistic ships and the la uh, the amphibious ships, basically, was what it's Well, you know, uh, we can't do this, obviously, because this <clears throat> company doesn't produce davits which are strong enough to lift this weight in these in this scenario these scenarios. And I looked at them, a the person who said this, and then I looked at the engineer next to me, and I said, to the engineer. Is there any engineering reason it can't be done? Nope. What you're saying is that there is a 5% difference between the operating parameters of their current top-of-the-range Davit system and what you're requiring. Mm-hmm. I'm fairly certain if you give them the money, they will produce a Davit which can do what you require. Oh, uh, they didn't listen. I think they were looking for an excuse to not do go down the project route, honestly. And that was the excuse they went with. But this shows you, if you want to, uh, th this is why when some people turn around and tell me, oh, the reason this uh, program failed is because of this technological scenario. And I sit there and go, nope, it didn't. That's why. That Those experiences are why. I have... Absolutely no faith in the reasons given 90% of the time for why projects are cancelled. Because usually, more often than not, it's someone either wanting to cancel the project, so looking for excuse, and so not asking the right questions to get the answers which reveal that they could be fixed, or it's the other answer is this is impossible to fix. Under current budget, we would have to use more money. And they never mention the under current budget. Let's run. Trying to think of a new video. I'm not sure what to do. Hmm. I would probably suggest, considering the videos you've been doing quite well and they've been quite fun videos, I would suggest just bouncing from them to something similar. So, there's not been that many good videos done on the Polish destroyers at the moment. 
I say that as someone who keeps toying with the idea of doing a video about the Polish destroyers, entirely about them, but hasn't really had the time in other projects to go and do the necessary digging, and basically ring up a, a couple of friends who are specialists in the Polish Armed Forces in World War II, and go, send me all your knowledge. And remember, side note on the Type 82, could they have put the Sea Dart launcher after the forward turret, do away with the Akira, and put a hangar off, effectively create a giant Type 42? Well, yes, you could do that. Would it be a more effective ship? Probably, but it would probably be easier, actually more sensible to create a slightly bigger ship. And... Do the Sea Dart launcher after the forward turret and um, put a hangar aft, but also not get away with the Akira. Because the Akira is actually quite useful to have. <sighs> Jordan, what was the most expensive single weapon system in World War II? I'm thinking possibly the B-29 at 3 billion. I... I think your ooh, most expensive weapon system. <sighs> well, the Manhattan Project costs roughly one point nine billion. Northern bomb site costs one and a half billion. So you could probably argue that the entire nuclear bomb drop on Hiroshima and Nagasaki cost somewhere in the region of five point four billion. If you add in the B-29 Manhattan Project and Norden Bombsite. Can you tell us something about five ships named Cockchafer and why was, was there so much chafing on the gun? <laughs> okay, for starters, for starters, as I mentioned when talking about Cockchafer, it's basically another name for a Maybug. Okay? Now, as for the ships named after that, well. As mentioned, there have been a few. There has been, in 1812, HMS Cockchafer was five guns. It was a US schooner, possibly the Spence, that the Royal Navy captured and used the ship's tender. She captured two American armed brigs, uh, one in a single ship action during her time, and the Royal Navy sold her in 1815. So that's quite an illustrious name for that. Uh, then she was an Albacore-class wooden screw gunboat, launched in 1855 and sold in 1872. And then she was a Bantara-class co composite screw gunboat, launched in 1881 and sold in 1905, before she was insect-class gunboat. So basically she's been a small ship and I've got four. Uh, there's also an armed lugger. Which is, how do I put this politely, a hired armed vessel. That serves with the Royal Navy 1794 to 1801. And, well, it was probably an oared vessel. But it had an arm of eight guns. Q-chips. Okay. 
Making sure there's an eight second delay in their Steam bet stream between my laptop and my PC. My old laptop is on Wi-Fi. It's eight seconds ahead of my fancy PC. <laughs> Apparently, the fiber optic router. <laughs> yeah, life happens fun sometimes, doesn't it? Um, JL, how viable would an 18 inch Vanguard be to build instead of 15 inch produced? Uh, you would have to build a very different hull. Because let's be honest, if you're going to build something with eight 18 inch guns or even six 18 inch guns. Those turrets are going to individually be as wide as a triple 15 inch turret would be, which means you're going to need to have a fatter hull, which means to maintain the same uh, factor of speed and performance, you're going to need a longer hull, which means it's going to be a far bigger vessel. No, sorry, it's like the other day when the person I knew said they wanted me to drive 35 miles to pick them up and drive them two blocks to a short store instead of paying $40 for an Uber. They offered me $20. <laughs> you said he's staying in bed. They decided it was worth 50. I got him put my clothes on. Very sensible, Melly 1640. If I, you know, there, there is a great scene from a certain movie which starred Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, where the gentleman would not get out of bed for a million dollars, less than a million dollars. I can understand that. I wish I was in the kind of promotion where that was an option. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Yes, Alex, it was more expensive than the bomb. I thought it was more expensive than the bomb. <sighs> Go on, Cameron. Do you cut in the cost of tube alloys to the Manhattan Project? Um, honestly, I was going off the figures provided on the History Channel website. <laughs> so, I just quickly was double checking my figures the easiest way. Because I didn't ha don't have a list of that. And that's one where they're all provided in dollars. Which is useful. But of course, then you've also got to add the invasion of Iajima and various other places to get the islands. So, really, to get the ma the nuclear bomb drop on Hiroshima and Nagasaki is quite massively expensive once you start factoring in all the battle naval battles to get to position to launch the, attack the amphibious assaults on the islands. The amphibious assaults on the islands, the reclaiming of the islands, the building, uh, the building of the and protecting of the airfields on the islands. And then the old logistics to support them, as well as making the project in the first place. It's a mini, mini multi layered project. I was asking, Doc, I have a whole library on the Polish Navy. All in Polish, of course. But I think we can work something out. And I can record how to pronounce Malankia and other difficult names. That can be a very useful way to start. Um, my plan, I had to say, was to look up one of my friends called Thomas. Now, Thomas is cool. <laughs> Thomas speaks many, many languages. And is a fellow a studier under Professor Andrew Lambert. So we kind of get on that way. But actually, Thomas is Japanese. And lives in... I think he's currently living in Lithuania. But I'm going to just check that one. Yeah. No, he's in Warsaw, Poland now. He's been doing, he's been wandering between the two. But he lectures at uh, Vistula University. And he's got his PhD from Oxford in economics and other things. Tom is absolutely 
and I will say this quite honestly, absolutely brilliant and also absolutely bonkers, like I am. So, we had a very fun time and actually became friends teaching for a summer in Cambridge together. And, um, yeah, he's basically my go-to. Whenever I have... I've got a standing invitation if I visit Poland. If I do not go and see Thomas, then I will have a average height Japanese man hunting me down and dragging me back there. But we had great fun to go because I don't drink and he of course is well, he is as close to a professional drinker as you can get probably when he wants to. He's very serious about it, which is uh, uh, something he comes by honestly. And um the thing was, he's completely sober while he's drinking. <laughs> and we've had these really fun conversations while keeping track of all the other staff we were working for when we were working with when we were out and just making sure they were all okay. Great guy. But no, he's usually who I go to for Polish questions. Um, and Age of Unknown, oh goodness, Polish Destroyers in World 2. Are you sure you want memes in chat for years given people are still referencing Drax reactions as a suggestion of a Polish R class? Mm. Honestly, I can see a lot of good reasons to give Poland an R class battleship. However, there is also a very good reason not to the sheer manpower and personnel requirements involved in running one. Because you also then have to have escorting destroyers for it. For it to go and do things. And if the Polish want something, it's a good way of gi giving them something really cool and then limiting them. The cruisers they got were actually probably more effective. And honestly, they needed the cruisers and the destroyers as well as the uh, with, the, with the battleship if they wanted a full a proper task group. Which is what they probably deserved. But they didn't have the personnel for it. They needed more personnel, basically. And with all the brigades and formations they were putting together, there's only so much you can do. George Newman, 5.4 billion little boys still missed the target by 800 feet. I don't think that really uh, mattered. Mr. Anderson, do you know why Thames Ironworks and Shipbuilding Company went defunct in 1912? Okay, there are various stories, but basically the one I tend to subscribe to is um, they were banking on getting an Admiralty contract for a battleship. And if we consider what are ordered in 1912. Now, Queen Elizabeth class are all laid down, well, the first two are laid down in October 1912. That's Queen Elizabeth and Warspite. Well, my theory often is that Thames Ironworks were also in the bidding for do a, to do a Queen Elizabeth class battleship, and they didn't get it. And without with them getting no battleships that year, their troubles they had cleared their decks to try and help to help out the navy so much in previous years because they've been doing so much work for the navy in the previous years that suddenly when the navy pulled away, they didn't have the merchant orders to keep themselves afloat, and then they go kaput, which is a real problem for the Royal Navy in World War One. But it they kind of apparently there is a rumor they pissed off Churchill. Which you can sort of go with, eh, maybe, maybe not, but remember Churchill is First Lord of the Admiralty at this point, and Churchill at that point was at his youngest and pettiest in terms of politics in the beginning of uh, prior to World War One. He matures, Churchill does. I know there are people who like him and hate uh, those people who don't like him and those who like him. I... <sighs> I think he... I intend to be on the view of Churchill. I respect him for the roles he had to do and decisions he had to make. 
I think he did as good as he as well as he could. And I think honestly, there weren't any le how do I put this legitimately a legitimate better options in many times for the positions he said. In that people can go for all these things of well, it could have been this person and they would have been great. They would have been great. But they need to fulfill certain criteria and fulfill certain roles before they will actually command the, the support of the House of Commons and be able to be Prime Minister or this. Can they do they do that? No. There's a reason they're not in a position to do it before or be, at that time. There is a reason why you are down to pretty much two candidates. Churchill and Halifax. And frankly, if I have to pick between Churchill and Halifax, I'll pick Churchill ten times every day of the week and fifty times on Sunday. Because Halifax is worse. And I can say that because of one thing. Churchill may make the wrong decision, but he will at least make a frigating decision. Halifax will differ for months, weeks, months, weeks, years. And I will put it in a mixed up order for, that reason, for a reason. He just won't make a decision. And you need someone who's going to make a decision and who's got the nerve for it to be Prime Minister in World War Two. And yeah, that's not going to be any... And some of the other options, they go, oh, they could be this person. Yes, they're very nice, but they're not arrogant enough. And that sounds terrible to say you need someone who's arrogant as Prime Minister in World War II, but you do. Because they're going to be literally taking the weight of the country on their shoulders. And if they don't think they're the biggest, bestest, meanest thing since sliced bread, that they are the absolute one and only person for the job, they ain't got enough ego to take that pressure. It's one of the, pro it's one of the catch 22s of actually leading a country. You need someone who's humble enough to listen to advice, but has a big enough ego to make a decision, stick with it, and know, and carry it when things go wrong. And getting that balance, that person, is very, very difficult. Practically impossible. Churchill was very close to being on the balance, which is fine. Yes, he's got quirks, which frankly are annoying. And he has a habit of blaming other people when he does make a mistake when he's writing up his histories afterwards, because he writes the histories. But he doesn't tend to make exactly the same mistake twice, which is actually a problem, because in World War I, he, of course, is focusing on building capital ships and all those things, and doesn't build enough escorts. And then in World War II, he, cancels the, he stalls the capital ship program to build escorts when you actually need the capital ships, so you need the carriers as well. And, yeah, life happens. Mm -hmm. My goodness, I remember a story that the Doolittle planes had to have their Nordens stripped out and the uh, improvised site put in. Joke being the improvised site worked better than the super secret Norton. The Norton's finicky, but it does work. Net Richards, if someone's actually managing to make dark matter bombs, my hat off to them. But in the nicest way... I don't think the European Union can do will be able to do that, and I don't think CERN is involved for that one. My God, two questions to this theme. What is your cutoff date when something is too recent? And if it's not too recent, are you planning on covering some effects? Um you have to remember my PhD is technically war studies, not naval history. Technically war studies. I'm a naval historian, but I'm technically a PhD in war studies, which means I do right up to current events in terms of teaching. And so yeah. I'll be getting pretty recent. I will try, as I did with discussions of ships, certain cruisers, etc. Over, if you notice the American cruiser project, by the time we got to the Ticos, which are still which are still in service, of course, 
I got very gave a very different style of presentation, very different style of information delivery than what I would give on the earlier Northamptons, etc. And there is a reason for that. So as long as you understand and don't mind me doing that, I can get quite current. University of Kent has a good a good program. I like the Union of Kent. I think I taught there not a while back. No, I didn't teach there. I was vis I visited and gave a lecture. I think. Was it at Kent or was it Canterbury? And I just went to dinner at Kent. And see, to the rest, I went to what I I I gave a a talk at one. I had a when had dinner at the other. And this was a long, long time ago. And it was to a now defunct society, I think. But no, it, that was an interesting time. I, I spent a lot of time going around various you know, Canterbury. I had a friend who spent uh, basically did all his geography and all sorts of degrees at um, Canterbury Christchurch. So I got to know the area quite well and got quite a few connections in there for a while. Hmm. The cost of the tube allies are including cost of Manhattan. That was the largest equipment of Hmm. That makes sense. Hello, Yosfunk. Hello, Costa Drazenus, and hello, Roland Cash. You remember us for two months and four months. Cool. Um. <coughs> and Jordan, on the other hand, we would have needed to take those islands in order to invade Japan anyway. Hmm. Not really. Yes and no, to an extent. Yes and no. There is a whole debate about whether or not you were better loading up ships in America and just convoy them straight across, or whether you were better stockpiling supplies closer and then convoying them from closer. There's a whole debate about that, really. I doubt squad. Much loads. The close only on saying close any counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and atomic bombs. Hmm. For reference, people who didn't see Drax's introduction, uh, the suggestion of Polish art class was to have an evil supervillain laugh for about half a minute before composing himself. I can, I can see that one. Uh, Stop Thompson, speaking of Spanish, have you had a chance to see Simon War Simon's war graphics on the current, current procurement? Something was missing. If I mention any Navy items with it being split between the US and South Korea, what ships do you think the Polish Navy will be looking for at some point that new forces are walled? Terence for Russia and Belarus. Uh, they're buying, I think they're buy, uh, going, planning on buying Type 31s. I seem to remember that being the project they're looking at. I'm not sure if it's been announced yet or wh whether they've firmed up on that. I can't remember from the top of my head. Why are people being rude about Halifax? Halifax is home to the wonderful Sackville. That makes everything wonderful. It is home to Sackville. It's also home to a wonderful fort which has one of the best musket armed infantry regiments I have ever seen on parade. Who are very good at musket drill and very engaging when talking to an audience and actually well informed. 
And I had great fun talking to them and going, so why do we not have something like you in the UK? Because I haven't met them yet. There might be, but I haven't met them yet and going around the various castles. I went, well, we get paid. You're not volunteers. No, we're paid. You're paid members of staff. I love this place. So, as far as I'm concerned, Halifax is great because of Sackville and because of the fort and its regiment. Okay? <clears throat> I would happily spend a lot of time watching that regiment do its drill. They did it very proficiently and very well. And the fact that most of them seemed to be history students who were in university as well just made me even happier because that meant I would get to teach people who were loving history. And it would be great. <sighs> My Hunter, Truman said the best thing to do in a crisis is the right thing. The second best is the wrong thing. The worst thing to do in a crisis is nothing. Mm hmm. Ah, we're talking not about that the Halifax the town. We're talking about Halifax the person. Yeah, Halifax had many issues. He had many, many issues. Uh, nice one. What Trichard was willing to throw as many ships as he can, but uh, 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 Bismarck to kill her after it sank Hood. I do not believe Halifax would have done. I don't think Churchill really had a choice in that matter. I think the Royal Navy was throwing itself willingly. Let's be honest, half the ships which turned up to fight Bismarck were not actually ordered to fight Bismarck. They just heard she was in a certain direction and went... And I am including an entire flotilla of tribal class destroyers in that number. There are also several battleships and a battle cruiser, which are not actually part of the battle with Sinka, but which are not far away going, We're here just in case you need support! And Rodney's part of firing away going boom, 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 with everything he has. King George V is joining in whenever she can. And there are ships on the horizon going, Hello! Just in case you need support, we're here! He's renowned and a couple of our class are not that far away going, Hello! See us! We have our hands raised! They're like the, t the student at the back of the class when the teacher's directly trying to stop and not, answer, not make eye contact with them because they answer every other question in the class. R basically waving their hands around going, We're here! We're here! <sighs> Mm, you say BS, I would say good marketing. And that's a tr another thing we have to deal with in the world. There is always marketing. There is always marketing. Uh, may I say, what, what is a dark matter bomb? Do you mean anti matter bomb? Uh, I think that's probably what it, I thought that was probably what Richards was going on about. But there have been there are various phrases about it. Dark matter is what makes up the universe anyway. I don't think it. I think probably it. But uh, it's considering the vast majority of the universe is made is vast majority of matter in the universe is dark matter. If it was in any way inclined to be explosive, I think the, the universe would have gone boom already. So I'm presuming it's inert now. It might have originally been the Big Bang. We don't know. There have been several theories I've read recently about that, which were kind of interesting, but they're in physics journals, so they're a bit nuts. And, um... Yeah. Captain Seafall. In Psalm 94, Churchill was a perfect human being for the job at hand. The rest of the time, he needed an Alan Brook to sit on him. <laughs> eh, an Alan Brook or a Cunningham. Both were quite capable of doing sitting. No, you do, can't carry. You do need someone of Churchill's drinking ability to be able to sit down with Stalin because those two. There is an interesting conversation for about them from one of the conferences where they're staying up late. The meeting's going late into the night, and about middle of the night, they're still talking away as 
they do. Which is probably with the help of interpreters, because I don't think Churchill's Russian was that good, or Stalin's English that good. And they realize that there's only, like, two other people other than them still awake. All the rest have reached their tolerance of drinking level and have collapsed. I'm not 100% sure about that story, but it's just... It, it, it's close enough to sounding like it could be true with Churchill and Stalin that I will give it the benefit of doubt and actually, expl actually suggest it occasionally in fun moments. Consider answer, what is better, humanities or social sciences? Um, I prefer humanities mainly because of the hubris that goes into social sciences. And this is someone with, by the way, an MSc. I am a Master of Science, that is my uh, Master's degree is in International Conflict in MSC, and basically the, the level of, uh, the thing is history is the study of stuff, and the study of things and the passing on of the information. War studies is to an extent that as well as some of the international relations and science, and political science stuff thrown in. The thing that really worries me when I was dealing with some of the social science side of international relations, etc., was when they tried to make predictive theories. And you... I don't like the idea of making policy decisions sometimes based on the prediction of a logarithm. Because there are some things you can work out with a logarithm. There are certain things that you can, if you practice if you program in the most data, the correct amount of correct data in the correct way, you will get a, the likely, uh, likely result and so you can anticipate and deal with it. But the trouble is in international relations. There is an X factor which we haven't yet managed to quantify. We don't really understand it, but things can happen in international relations which happen in no other field really of government. Probably due to the complexity and different comp different factors involved and the different levels of ego and reading and the way that we talk of the past of being a foreign country, but and let's be honest, if you think in a different language to someone else or the way someone else thinks, that already gives you a different worldview that is dramatically different. For example, someone who speaks English as their first language is going to have a very different w mental worldview to someone who speaks let's say a more artistic language, Spanish, as their first language. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong, please don't, I'm not saying that, or better or worse, or better or sort of worse in terms of worldview, it's a different worldview, because how you describe things, how you approach things, depends on the linguistics you think in. And, yeah, this is why I, I find things an issue. Especially when they try to use the, uh, what I would call the Anglophone countries as a relationships, as the model to build their practices on. Because those countries have a scenario where they all do speak English or variations of. And that gives them a similarity in terms of psychological approach. Um, the Bengal famine is one which comes up quite a lot. Um, what we do know from facts is that he did ask the Americans for uh, for ships. He tried to find ships himself. But mostly the Bengal famine is about a breakdown in logistics and it's a long-running thing. Yes, you can blame it on the British government because they're the government but not the British government of Churchill. You can blame it on successive British governments who didn't build the railway across India. In the nicest way, they had uh, built an entire system which was 
based on getting the goods from the inlands to the coast and then moving them around on ship. So you actually had plenty of food in India at the time. It just wasn't in the right places. And getting it round ran into the German, Italian, Japanese submarines operating in the Indian Ocean, etc. And the various vessels they had there. And you had to convoy them, you had to... And there's all sorts of resources you have to have, and this all delays things because of the Battle Atlantic and the other ba operation, uh, operation Torch and all sorts of operations going on at the time. Bengal Famine, therefore, is a perfect storm of events which ends in an absolute disaster for the people affected by it. And it is. But, I think it's very easy to glib to blame it on Churchill, because Churchill had been many things, but honestly, it's Churchill in his role as Chancellor years, years and years before, which you can possibly folk to point to more than Chartered Churchill in his role as leader in World War II. Now, why am I saying that? Because... Churchill in World War II is Prime Minister running the country, yes. But Churchill as Chancellor could have put money into building a railway across India. That would have been 30 years prior to the events. 20, 30 years prior to the events. And then you wouldn't have had the problem. So, yeah. That's the issue. It, it, the issue here for... India, and the reason that this happens, is an infrastructure one. It's not a I don't care about you, I don't care about India, all sorts of things. There's, there are lots of things which are alleged to have been said at various points by Churchill. There are, But what we can look is we can look at his actions. And his actions were... He was trying to get ships out there. He was trying to get aid and stuff moved. But it was all a bit, it would all have been a big commitment. And no one had the spare forces available. Now, I, you can argue that humanitarian reasons they should have cancelled an operation, made, it, uh, made the stuff available. And that is a legitimate case to make. But honestly, the base point it comes down to it's a, it's the lack of the railway. It's the lack of being able to move supplies from one side of India to the other. Which would have been strategically so frigging useful in World War Two, For many other reasons, just not just moving food. Daniel Phillips, how Harada's fleet disappears out of trees? What would the Saxon Norman fleet battle? Uh, uh, what would the Saxon, or what would the Saxon Norman battle fleet battle look like? Assuming luck puts the Saxon positions to engage. Well, not too dissimilar. So probably, uh, well, both of you sort of will be using Viking Norse style vessels. And we'll be basically getting into engagement range with archers and then trying to board each other. So, yeah, it's going to be a land battle at sea. My friend, can you please do a video series on the Chinese Navy from 1949 to present? Um, that is on a list of things I would like to do, but... 
I have to get better books before I do that, and I have to get some better sources before I do that. No offense, how effective do you think a 5.5 inch dual purpose would have been in World War II if it had got development? Been very useful. It could have equipped quite a lot of your light cruisers and possibly you could have equipped some larger destroyers of it as well. I saw Halifax, I don't know if you missed Sackville Hiders in Hamilton. Just going to add that to just point out because so people know where Hyder is and know where Sackville is. I also thought of Heights Abraham and amusing sneaking up on a cliff of the British to in Quebec. Eh, it's always fun. We like to sneak up places. Richards, I'm not sure what physics papers you've been reading, but I don't think you're on the right track with them. Don't know, so Dreadnought is completed with an F3 layout. How do other nations respond? Ah, it depends. Does she come up with an F3 layout with the 16.5 inch or 15 inch guns and the speed? If she comes out with the speed as well, then that's problematic. But if she comes out just in the F3 layout with the 9, tw uh, the 9 12 inch guns, and the probable speed you could get from that scenario... <sighs> she probably wouldn't be a 21 knot ship, she'd be... <sighs> Mass on that shaping, hull shaping power... 23 point something knots, probably. Um, doing a quick maths in my head of it. It's fun. It, it would, the other nations' reactions would be probably to build their own versions of it. Because that would now be what Dreadnought battleships look like. Um, it would give... It would give... Fisher his forward firing, six guns firing forward scenario, which he really wanted. It would make Fisher so happy, actually, in F3 allowed. <laughs> yeah, Scotland leaving the UK would be a bit major problem for NATO, but it would also be a major problem for Scotland. And this is speaking as I'm with a large amount of Scottish family who are definitely are mostly inclined on the voting to stay front, and even the ones who are inclined to actually the ideas of leave are going, this doesn't make the case. It's one of the interesting things. One of them I talked, uh, I know, whenever they're asked on opinion polls whether they want to, whether they would support, uh, whether they want another referendum and they support leave, they go, yes. And then I go, how would you vote in it? They go, no, because we're not ready for it. We haven't got any, any of the economics in place, any of the scenarios in place. I sit there and go, you do realise you're going to end up getting ref a, referendum, a referendum and you're either going to get the vote you want but not be ready for and you're going to re you know that or you're going to not get it and eventually you're going to get people all referendum out and they're not going to want it again. Yeah, the whole RN throwing themselves against Bismarck, one reason why I laugh about sea lion conducts for news. Whole German fleet. Uh, are you sure everyone isn't going to throw themselves at the German fleet with the country online? More than likely, but there's also going to be one of the b things we're talking about today in the book terms, um, charging in as well.
And Murky Cedric as well, three seasons of science fiction series. Dark Matter. Eh, fun times. John Luke, I'd like to see. Who would win an engagement between Atrus Ron, Nate Peak Condition, versus the USS Missouri at Cape Horn? At Cape Horn? Ooh. Rodney in peak condition versus Missouri at Cape Horn. Um, okay, Missouri has the speed, so she can dictate the engagement range. But Rodney is basically a solid lump of steel in comparison. I'm tempted to say it's a draw, because if Missouri hangs around in range long enough to try and batter through Rodney, she's going to also give Rodney time to batter through her. But, especially as Rodney can present a far narrower profile if she wants than Missouri can to get, have all guns firing. It's a case of, mm, I, I think it might be a lucky shot which decides the battle. Darius Rodowski, what do you mean? Both Stan and Churchill spoke fluent drunk. They understood each other perfectly. <coughs> yep. <sighs> This one, talking about people reaching limits, Paddy Ashton was sent by the foreign, co uh, uh, foreign Commonwealth Office to Balkans after the collapse of Yugoslavia. And respect to the warlords by swapping war stories from time in SAS and drinking them on the, under the table. table. Yeah, I'm going to keep quiet on that one and move on. If the first book is what I think it is, it's good. If the fifth book intrigues me. They are good books. They are good books. Let's see if I've caught up with the questions and then I'll start the books. Yeah, it is always garbage in, garbage out. The Bengal famine can be blamed on the Imperial Japanese army. They were ones occupying Burma, which was Bengal's main source of rice at the time. Yeah, that is another little issue going on, but as I said, the British had designed the entire system around always being able to use the sea. And whilst such do Vichelle, you're right, there have been famines in Bengal before the British Empire and after it, so blaming one on single person of government is rather unreasonable. There is the fact that when you're the government, it, the buck stops with you. Whichever government you are, the buck stops with you. Thanks, Night Hand Programs. Yes, the difference in language is crucial. There is even a suggestion the difference in nature of how English is spoken between the UK and US had a big impact on the breakdown of US, US Japanese relations. As the nature of the translation of intent is different between Brits and Americans when the Japanese formerly talked to Brits. Mm hmm. I'd say it's also something to do with the fact that the Americans have a habit of sending warships to Japan to basically, bully, and basically force them to do things. That d does tend to leave a legacy of not liking you. I'm sorry, it, 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 it's, it's a case of mm, the Americans were the mean ones who bashed their way in. 
the British were the nice ones who turned up and sold them weapons to stop people bashing their way in, it does kind of help make a difference in relationship tone. And it is the British Embassy taking advantage of the situation, yes. But, yeah. I was asking, a bit behind, yes, the Arrowhead A140 aka Type 41 is officially announced as the Mesnick program. Currently, it's in the infrastructure setting phase at the shipyards. That'll be good. I would say with Caesar leading charges, actually, Richards, there is actually quite a good possibility he did. And there is a reason for that. It's traditional for the Roman commander to command the last reserve and put themselves at the last reserve. And by the point at which they're committing the last reserve, there's nothing else they can do. But also, let's be honest, the last charge into the enemy is often the deciding point of victory. So it is a glorious charge because I charged in at the head of these troops and I won. The fact that I was charging in at the head of Trianii and picked, very, very picked, ghoulish um, horsemen who are my cavalry bodyguard and equites, maybe some Roman cavalry, it is neither here nor there. The fact is I charged in and won. And personal valour is important for Roman leaders, especially to not just emphasise, but not to fake, because you have to remember, whilst only, our, only Caesar's account of, Gaul, of his campaign in Gaul really survives for us today, during that period, there would have been other accounts going back from other officers, from other members of the senatorial classes who are trying to curry favour with their patrons, sending back accounts of what's going on. So he can't embellish things a lot. He can embellish things to an extent, but not dramatically. Now, for instance, if there's ever a time where where you or a researcher goes to China and is floating over with you, can you try and get some film from the Gulf Class SB? I believe she's the last one in existence. I agree, and that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> Martin, Sea Lion, German Air Force. We are real disguise. Great idea. German Army. It's just like a river crossing, right? We can manage it. German Navy. Oh, God, we're all going to die. <laughs> yeah. Carver Gaswick. No, the, uh, the economic measures. Um... Scotland has issues financially. And one of their big issues is their service. They've got a service sector economy, and as you all know, as it's quite understood, with service economies, it depends on the broad strength of the whole economy for your service sector, because especially banks, etc., they have to be capitalised from a central bank. They have to be supported. And I'm not 100% going to go into the economics of it. As people who are far better economists than me have tried to explain to me, and I've gone, thank you. Basically, for Scotland, quite a lot of their banks would have to. Um, well, they're okay as part of while well, they're part of the British system, but once you lose the banks and you lose various other supports, then it becomes very difficult for the Scottish government to maintain the current level of um, regime they like in terms of social safety, uh, social uh, social safety net. I'm sure they figure out a way, but it'll be very expensive a few years to work get in. Vanguard, I've been researching Asia Petrodon, very interesting indeed, but one thing Ari Burt's book is excellent for facts and figures, but the writing is a bit lacking in my opinion. I'm going to keep quiet on that one.
Mr. Ryan said, I would argue that economics to buck doesn't always stop the current government, as the changes in economics take years to be fully felt. I can agree with that one, but if you've been a colonial power for a couple of centuries, it's kind of hard to pass the buck. There is literally, in living memory, in, in many people's living memory, there is no one else around who's responsible. Oh no. The British were well, ha quite happy to let the Americans bash into Japan first. Then we could be their friends and protectors and use them to limit the power of the Americans in the um, Far East. <laughs> Richards, all, all hail the Mighty Caesar. Yeah, that's great. It certainly says they repeatedly. Impressive, too. Yes, well, it's great when you lead the final reserve in personally, because also when you're leading in the final reserve as a general in that period, what else can you do? There is. All your senior commanders will be committed fighting elsewhere. The only person left who is senior enough to lead a combined force is you, and you have nothing else you can be doing with your time. Nothing at all. Because you're just sitting there watching the battle. So you go demonstrate personal valour and greatness by leading in the reserve. And win. I don't have armor weapons like Drak does, Fushi. Um, well, when I say I don't have armor weapons like Drak does. In need of a polish. I have on loan from Drak a helmet. And now I'm remembering why I always wear a cap underneath it when I put it on. Anyway. It's always kind of interesting to wear. Mm-hmm. And... Many said, would Scotland not be able to support things that are like in the profits in North Sea oil? Well, here is the thing. Where do the profits in oil come from? When it's taken out of the water, or taken out from the ground... Right, under the water or on the ground, or when it's been refined. And... Well... The refineries in the UK, there is... Humber Refinery? Which is in North Lincolnshire. The Lindsay Oil Refinery in North Killingham. The Grangemouth Refinery, which is in Scotland. The Stanlow Refinery, which is in Ellesmere Port, Northwest England. Pembroke Refinery, Wales. Forley Refinery, Hampshire. And the Harwich Refinery, which is. In Harwich. Harwich. Uh, those are the current refineries in work at the moment. And so, if you think about that, the Scottish refinery, the Grangemouth refinery, processes 10 million tonnes a year. The others, between them, 11.5 million, 11 million, 10, uh, 12 million, so that's 24.5 million, 10.5 uh, million from Pembroke, so that's now 34.5 million, half a million from Howitch, which takes it up to 35 million, oh, and 16 million tons a year from Forley, which is um, 51 million tons a year. Uh, yes and no, basically. They would have some money, but not as much as you necessarily get under the British system, where 
under the current formula in the UK, which is called the Barnet Formula, the British government basically gives them a larger proportion of the revenue from those, from the oil extracted on that, than they get from the refineries. But they had. Yeah, it will be quite good on the Minion. Roman politicians need glory to advance. It's one of the things said about Krasus. He had wealth, influence, but no triumph, which led to his unfortunate demise. Yes, because he didn't get proper intelligence about what he was going to be fighting. I've recently taken far more interesting uh, troops with him. There's a lot left in terms of oil and gas under the North Sea. But again, it's getting harder to get at, and again, it's not when it comes out the ground you make the money, it's when it's refined. <clears throat> but sadly enough, this is all I have. However, there might be more sword fighting coming soon in another video with me and Drac. Yeah. I have lights up above me. Come to see Roman leaders are leading in final results. Getting killed leading cavalry charge would probably be a lot less painful than the consequence of going home having lost. Another good reason to do it. Um, no, sorry. why did anyone take it? No one took any issue of HMS Pansy. It's one of those myths which is established in history. It's, it's basically, it's become an established myth in some books and popular culture, and it's absolutely twaddle. No one did. Alfred B228. The Iron USN used inches for their guns. Other nations used uh, millimeters. Instead of going 310 or 330, they built them to match the UK and the US 305 and 381. I find it a bit odd, given why people use metric. <sighs> Honestly? Mostly because they are using the guns which are standardised. So, for example, 12, 14 inch, and 16 inch, let's be honest, it sort of makes sort of sense for jumps. Uh, the French sort of use so many different sources for their gun technology that, frankly, they uh, produce really weird stuff. And the British are just being the British. British, it's the Spaceballs edition. Hmm, we could do that at some point. Fushi, I am not going on a blind date like this. My Tinder profile suffers enough from me being a geek and needing to go to the gym. And I do need to go to the gym. Actually, at some point... At some point... There might be a real change to the channel, because... I am considering... Buying a whole load of cans of 1901 Iron Brew and basically going, thing of, I will have one can of, uh, of 1901 Iron Brew at every live, and that will be my Iron Brew for the week for a few months while I get back into the gym and try and lose some weight. I'm still sort of working out where to, well, what to do. That's good. There is some extra taxation on the extraction oil too, and, and rights fees government collects for extraction. True, there is that, but the trouble is if you raise that too much, then other, the companies will go elsewhere to get their oil. Right then. I am not doing that. Let's start with some books, shall we? I seem to have sort of caught up. It doesn't appear to be raining. It might be snowing, but it's not raining in Ireland.
Bam. My coach, Tringona Channel Jim, Treadmill Historian. Um, tempting. I think I'll keep the Hot Top Historian whenever I visit a Hot Top. I like those. I might do some Jim Historian stuff because actually I do have a um, idea for a few videos about PT in the Navy. But I would have to get one of my friends to help me out of that. How was that? Because he actually does a lot more of the PT with the Royal Navy than I do. So, and I think it'd be good, uh, cool to do some of the history of physical training in the Royal Navy. But to be honest, before I'm next to him on camera, I want to have lost some weight. So, yeah, I will be. Um, Jimming it pretty hard for a couple months before I actually go anywhere near being on camera with him because Look, I have self-confidence and I, I am fine with how I am But I am not standing next to a six foot two physical Adonis Looking like this. There is some part of me which is going, okay I don't want to look like I'm completely a... Mm. <laughs> did the Royal Navy did the Royal Navy ever considered converting naval shells into bombs out of Japan, and did they have a dive bomber who could have delivered us a resulting joy to turbots? Um, no. Basically, the they had lots of aircraft which did try and do did do various dive bombing attacks. Um, Swordfish was ca quite a capable dive bomber when it wanted to be. Uh, Skewer was, of course, designed as a dive bomber M in the face of much opposition, which is why it was called a fighter. Uh, basically, the Royal Air Force kept going in the Air Ministry, not the Royal Air Force. More than that, they uh, kept going. You don't need an. Air, you don't need a. Uh, you don't need a dive bomber. Da 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 da. And eventually, the Royal Navy just went run. So we're gonna get a fighter, which is gonna be two seater, and it's all gonna be built around this fancy bomb site and bomb dropping mechanism. But yeah, it's a fighter. Trouble is, that means it performs terribly as a fighter. But that's unsurprising. Because it's a dive bomber. And there's God. Why convert a one ton naval shell into a bomb when you've already got a ten ton bomb? That's basically the criteria the British were going with. How is that? Doctor, I'm going to ask you not to go to the gym because I don't want to go back to the gym. Uh, I'm going. I need to go. I need to go. Look, it's going to sound terrible, but I was doing everything I was planning on doing with the Cousins Gutra, and I've been writing and all sorts of things, and of course I haven't had a car, so it's been really easy to not go to the gym for the last couple of months, and I noticed it. I'd already gone down to a point where I was only going a couple of times a week when I got back from COVID, where of course I didn't go at all. Prior to COVID, I went pretty much every day of the week. So, from roughly 2016 to, 29, to March 2020, I went to the gym pretty much every day of the week. I would go, on average, I'd reckon about... 27 out of every 30 days a month. Because that's how I kept fit. Because I am a historian. Because I spend my day reading books like this. 
it this is the point I do not I come from a family which genetically predisposed to be physically active and we all notice this we have farmers sailors all sorts of things in our gene pool who were always out there working and that's what their bodies are orientated around and now we're doing engineering sitting in an office or teaching and again the other thing I used to do is I used to be regularly and now I do most of my teaching online I used to be doing teaching in in lecture theatres and I'd be walking up and down in front of the students and walking around and walking and talking and walking and talking so most days I would get 24 30,000 steps at the moment I'm lucky if I get to six to eight thousand steps so yeah I need to really rebuild my fitness because I want to because also if I am going to Australia which is the plan and all those details will be released hopefully later this month this year, I don't want to look completely like I'm a dump, a tub going on a plane. It's going to be terrible. Besides, it's far more comfortable to travel when you're actually slightly um, less rotund. Because, believe it or not, airline seats are never comfortable. No matter what class you're going to getting in, and I'm definitely not paying for first class to Australia. But... You do not want to be, um, you want to try and keep it trim. Next one, Doug Luck, could it be an idea to turn four inch or so shells into plane launch rockets? You could, but then it's asking, why would you? What are you going to find them for? What purposes are they going to be used for? And what role do they cover that you can't already do with something else you've already got? It's okay. That's the classic thing I always ask when people come back to me with these inventions. They go, yes, we can do this. And I go, great. What are you going to use it for? Yeah, I'm, I don't, this way, it, don't take it the wrong way. Even when I was working out, as I said, all that much, and I could do 5K on the treadmill sub 10 minutes, which I was pretty proud of. It wasn't a long way sub 10 minutes, please note. It wasn't a massive one. It was, it was usually a couple of seconds or two, three seconds underneath 10 minutes. But I was doing, I was quite proud of that. I will never have a six pack. I have had this talk with PT people when I've chatted with the Navy and all the things. I don't have the body shape that's going to give me a six pack unless I want to do steroids. And that ain't going to be me. I will always have a quad or a keg. At the moment, it's in its keg form. I'd like to get it back to its quad form. And I'll be happier that way. Do you have any prospects of visiting Kiwis if you're down under? Um. It all depends on funding and time. I'd like to. I'd like to visit. There's a certain dry dock in New Zealand I'd like really like to visit. But, you know. That's not Wait, you don't want to spend half the average, san average salary each way on the flights to Australia? No. Nice hearing. Why would I still bother on flag class soup to serve the World War II? Because they were still useful. No, Richards, I've never smoked. I um, Let's put it this way. My GP, the general practitioner in the UK, took me aside when I was younger and pointed out that my grandfather had had emphysema. In such, he had emphysema and was recommended to smoke a pipe to try and help it. And that actually caused him to be so unfit he couldn't join up in World War II. Instead, he became a fire watcher and was on St. Paul's and doing all sorts of things like that. And my mum has severe asthma, my sister has severe asthma, my great aunt had asthma and lung cancer three times in her life. Uh, my GP took me aside when I was 15 years old and I was in for a routine checkup and basically said to me, look, for other people smoking is a risk. For you, it's a, it's a suicide. Just don't. 
there are people for who who can smoke and be fine. There are people who, in the nicest way, look at your genetic family history and the rest of your family do not go there. And I didn't. Remember that, given the, Dr. Clark, you may touch on this later, but it strikes me, given the Japanese wanted individual ship superiority, why weren't armed carriers given greater consideration? Because, as I've said before, if you're going to lie, lie properly, and the Japanese were trying to not lie. They were lying, but not tr trying not to. Yeah, that's going to be my plan, Melanie. Although, here is what happened on the trip to Canada, right? Me and Dr. Dan, we travelled in, in premium economy. We were with the plebs. Gareth and Drac upgraded to first class both ways. Viva la revolution! <laughs> Although to be fair, me and Dan, uh, me and Dan were both on our flights, and we were on separate flights. Were actually um, on the exit row, which meant we had more leg room than they probably did. Why do you not upgrade? Because I'm a cheapskate, and also because I looked at the price and went, "Ah, oh, it'll be fine." And I had the exit row. I had the emergency exit row, so therefore the incentive for me to upgrade was less because I was thinking, "Am I going to get a seat with more leg room than I've already got?" Probably not. Don't like to go. My mum's got a um, Winnie Pooh bag, uh, Winnie Pooh uh, mug. Take your fan myself. Eh. We have all of them for some reason. Right then. So, great naval battles of the Pacific War. This is a good one. This is the official Admiralty accounts of Midway, Coral Sea, Java Sea, Guadalcanal, and Laity Gulf, compiled by John, uh, compiled by John Graham. It's interesting to read what the Royal Navy have written down. So, therefore, it's to an extent a primary source. So let me explain. This is not compiled by people who were actually there, although it is compiled from their information. It is an official government, uh, compiled from an official government documents in the National Archives, which are the official accounts. So it therefore can define as a primary source or a secondary source, depending on what you're looking at. If you're trying to understand what the Americans or Japanese were doing at the battle of uh, th these battles, it is a secondary source because it's the British account of what the Americans were doing and what they interpret, what the Americans interpreted the Japanese were doing. If you're looking at it for British learning from the Second World War, it is a primary source. Always useful to remember that. And I do exclude things like that because for my because uh, there are I have to teach this to my students quite early. What is a primary source? What's a secondary source? And a primary and secondary source can be contextual, depending on the question. It's the fun of the uh, the fun of history. <laughs> Japanese movements: the night of the fourth and fifth of June. The Japanese, who were planning a night attack with all their service forces on the American ships, at 1728 noticed that the general easterly course, which Task Force 16 had steered during the afternoon of the 4th. A few minutes earlier, one of the Chikuma reconnaissance aircraft had sighted what was estimated to be four enemy carriers, six cruisers, and 15 destroyers, in addition to the burning and listing Yorktown. Though fighters prevented the aircraft from shadowing. What had happened was that, unknowingly, the aircraft had sighted Task Force 16 twice within an interval of six minutes, and failed to recognise the two forces as identical. The report was not received until 1830 hours, and it was the first inkling Admiral Nagumo, commander of the striking force, had of the overwhelming American carrier strength. To an admiral who had just lost the whole of his carrier force, the blow must have been severe, and at 1915, to his further dismay, he received from the commander-in-chief, Admiral Yamato, a signal beginning, The enemy fleet has practically been destroyed and is retiring eastward and concluding the striking force, occupation force, a less 7th cruiser squadron, and advance force will merely make contact with and destroy the enemy. Such a mistaken, uh, mistaken appreciation of the situation clearly called for correction, and Admiral Nagumo pointed out unequivocally in two separate signals that the American force contained five carriers, four of which were still undamaged, and that all four... 
of his own carriers were out of action. Although the Admiral commanding his own 8th Cruiser Squadron, whose seaplanes had been doing all the useful reconnaissance, signalled that the enemy consisted of two carriers, and there was the suspicious circumstance that the aircraft which made the original report of four undamaged carriers was unable on the unable demand to supply the class and speed of more than two of them, and Rodrigo apparently paid no attention. At least half his destroyers were away assisting his crippled carriers, and he was in no condition to undertake a night action against an enemy without, with which, with which manoeuvre he was not in touch. He therefore abandoned the idea of a night attack, continued his north westerly course, and bent his energies to attempting to save his last remaining carrier, the Hiryu, and getting her out of the danger area. By the way, someone uploaded an interview documentary on Eric Brown, which talks more about a post-war career than other documentaries out there. Do you want me to leave a link to, uh, link where, when the live concludes? Off topic, I know, but I thought I'd ask. Yes, please. Upgrades on boarding tend to be much cheaper than the prices you can look up before. They can, but on this case, the um, uh, WestJet have a bidding system. Which was interesting. Trina, do you think lessons will be online or, per or complete in person or a mixture of both? Personally, I prefer more in person teaching and a bit online teaching. I think it's going to be a mixture in the end. I think it really will be a mixture in the end because there are some advantages for it, especially when teaching the uh, when teaching the international cohort of students. Let's take a So, why did the F Portuguese reclassify flag class sloops as cruisers? You'd have to ask the Portuguese that one. I've, I'm not quite sure. Um, because Master China, I already do book reviews. Um, thank you for the suggestion, but I already do it, and I actually get other people involved. I'm affiliate. Well, when I say affiliate, I'm not affiliated in terms of paid or anything like that. But I am. I've registered my details with lots of different publishers, and they send me the books. So there's a reason why you get so many pen and sword books here, because while I was writing a book for them, pen and sword went, "Oh, you do book reviews, don't you?" "Yes." "Oh, we'll send you the books then." Okay, thank you. And so I get a lot of pen and sword books. Um, but, you know, I'm working on... Root is just slightly more difficult to deal with. But I'm getting there. Um, it's not quite bent or broken. It's okay. It's a, There is, to an extent, some issues going on with it from the point of view... Of the fact that I built most of it from reclaimed wood. I it's all my shells, as I've said before, are built with wood which was left over from the building of the offices. So these offices are in the garden, and these are the, this is all wood which was left over from its construction, and I built with it. Um, the ship coat of arms behind my eight blocks is HMCS Star. Thanks, Jack Ray. I'm picturing the three of you on a plane on the same road, talking round trip on the bus. Just... No, luckily we were all separated, but we were talking. Let's put it this way: um, they were talking by via WhatsApp on the group because it was I flew out the day before. I got, as you know, there a day earlier. Picked up the hire car, went to see Hyder, had a night in Hamilton, went to did some initial discussions with the people on Hyder, then went, picked up the rest of the crew from <laughs> Toronto Pearson Airport. And you have never seen anyone come out more furious from an airport than Drac emerging from Toronto Pearson. I think he was prepared to start waging war on Canada at that point. He had, it, literally, he came out going, I, it was terrible. And, um, yeah. 
Once we got, uh, once everyone was out of Toronto Pearson and everyone loaded up in the car, drove them to Glynn's, where very, very nicely, Glynn and his wife, uh, his uh, wife, gave us dinner and fed us, and then yes, you know the rest, how the rest of us. And me and Drat came back the day after. Dan left the day earlier on the way home, and then me and Drat left the next day. And Gareth went off doing his train journey across Canada. Yes, it does. It, the, there is an advantage. This is no. There is no none of the post-war revisions. This is what they've appreciated at the time, which is really worthwhile. Interest, uh, worthwhile reading. But thanks for the suggestion, Quizmaster Chana, because I said, and actually, um, there's a few good people. Uh, one of the people I often recommend is um, one of the book review groups I often recommend. Are those which are done for Marine de Nord, uh, the North Marine. It's a great journal, and I've I've done some work with them before. Now they're lovely, and they do a lot of book reviews. Actually, for how do you define the official histories in terms of primary secondary sources? Depends on what you're looking for. If you're trying to find out the British government's official line, then they're a primary source. If you're trying to find out what someone else did, they're a secondary. Would it be fair to say there's still stuff we can learn about ships? Yes. <laughs> there is. There's lots of stuff which we don't know, know about them. This is the thing. We built them not that long ago, but there's still stuff we don't know about them. Because there's lots of history which is not recorded in the histories that have been passed down to us. And so that's why you have to go back to the primary source material, and that's why you have to go back further, for, uh, further through them and into other sources to look at their version of the variation of the primary source material to find out what might have been missing. Look, I had a very nice time. Going out across the Atlantic, I had one person who was a regular traveller who was sitting or, or sitting in the window seat, and we had free seats, and we had a space between us, a seat between us, which was free. So we had a seat in the middle which we could use for driving stuff, and we had I had all that leg space. And then coming back... Again, I had the seat empty there, and then there's someone else sitting in the window. It was really very comfortable for me. WestJet was lovely both ways. It was entirely recommend them. Very comfortable. There you go. Whoosh, that went flying. <coughs> no bookmark didn't fall out. So what do we build that we don't know about? No, it's going to sound strange. The people at the time who were building it knew that stuff. But let's put it so. One of the interesting conversations I've had with people when I was doing stuff about the tribals was the amount of stuff which wasn't written down. And it was just taken for granted that you knew what they were talking about. And I had this wonderful conversation at a conference with Norman Freeman, which was all about that. And about the difficulty in trying to find what to us are the known unknowns, because they were known at the time, because that's how they fought and taught, uh, fought and how they acted and how they approached things, but which are now unknown to us because we don't do things those way that way, and because the people who did it have all gone and no one asked them the question. 
and there are so many questions which people haven't asked. It gets quite disturbing at times, some of the things which haven't been asked. You sort of go, that would be one thing you'd think would have been asked. It would make sense to have been asked, but no. So anyway, I won a discussion about the pyramids not being built by aliens by mentioning that we can't build thick armor or large guns anymore, even though it was only, only 80 years ago. Exactly. The thing is, and this is something where I do agree with Elon Musk, is he points out, he pointed out in a discussion which was, we have this perception that technology constantly goes up and constantly goes forward and gets better. But if you're not investing and not growing and not maintaining that technology, it will drop down. Your understanding and knowledge of it will disappear. Because the stuff, the thing is, you have the published materials and then the unpublished materials, but you also have the whole culture and understanding, the unwritten stuff, which goes with the construction of it. And... That is based on institutional memory of generations upon generations training up the next generation and the, their experience and their experience being passed on, passed on, often through verbal extra, uh, verbal history and verbal tra uh, verbal sort of translated transmission of this information, and it's gone because no one wrote it down. So yeah, armor, big guns, we don't build those anymore. There are lots of things we don't do anymore. Uh, because we don't have the knowledge. And in order to rebuild that knowledge, it's very expensive. One of the big problems and one of the big expenses with the Queen Elizabeth class program, the aircraft carriers, was Britain hadn't built ships that big in such a long time that we had to rebuild the knowledge base of how to do it. And it wasn't as easy as going to the Americans because the Americans were going, well, we can answer your questions, but... There's a lot of things which you were sitting there, they were British would sit there listening to the Americans talk and they go, well, you never mentioned this. Oh, well, that's because we always do that. We didn't think you know, that's obvious, isn't it, surely? And it isn't. So anyway, it was trivial. That's why they didn't write it down. The most infuriating thing in history. Mm -hmm. There is some new research for the Roman cement, which apparently has some self-healing qualities. Yes. Roman concrete. Included quicklime and a few other things. Which creates self-healing qualities. But also you have to remember how long... The Romans were primarily working in concrete. They didn't have steel and glass and other things. They were working in concrete. They were obsessed with concrete. And they were working with very good concrete, thanks to a bit of luck, a quirk of fate and luck of where they were getting some of their material, their, some of their mixture from. They're going to be advanced at it. And then history loses all that. The USA lost the ability to plan and build infrastructure when in the 1980s, 90s, we stopped building, lost institutional industrial capacity. Well, that's one of the reasons why the UK were very, very careful when we stopped building. You, you will know when very soon they'll announce Crossrail 2. And the reason they announced Crossrail 2 is because Crossrail 1 is now is getting to the point where it's finished and they've handed over the construction programs. So, so they don't lose the knowledge, they will start Crossrail 2. So they maintain those people, that knowledge base. Because it makes it a lot cheaper than trying to rebuild it from scratch. <laughs> it's 
Scum Seaver, read really history not recorded. How complete are Royal Navy ships covers from the late 19th century? E.g. I've never seen anything mentioned uh, uh, mention overall length for the Imperius class. Only length between PPs. Welcome to the joy of naval operations. So. We're now on to our next book, which is the Soviet Navy. And this is a book produced by Bruce M. Watson and Susan M. Watson. It's good. And includes this chapter, which I rather like. And it's, it's one of those things where I get into people and sort of the discussions that come up quite regularly in terms of what was the Soviet Navy for. Since World War II, the Soviet Union, uh, Union's political ambitions have been challenged by states that have impressive maritime traditions. Many people argue that the post-Soviet, the Stalinist Soviet naval strategy has produced forces primarily designed to enhance the USSR's nuclear warfighting capability. Yet Soviet strategists realised that the USSR must also be able to conduct a non-nuclear war, which would last much longer than a quick nuclear confrontation. Long considered to be a less important mission in a quick, decisive nuclear conflict, sea lines of communication, slock interdiction, I received a renewed interest in, as the possibility of sustained conventional conflict has gained serious consideration. The interdiction role of Soviet surface combatants is not as great as that of either submarines or aircraft. As lacking aircraft cover, the surface combatants would be vulnerable when they sailed beyond the protection of shore-based aircraft. However, they would still perform a major support role. In the initial period of conflict, surface combatants in concert with aircraft and submarines would attack enemy naval shipping blocking Soviet submarine access to the high seas. Some naval major naval combatants would also serve as command centers to direct submarines and aircraft against enemy ships. Surface ships would also support ground operations, amphibious ships and would transport the Soviet naval infantry and army troops, and would, could contribute directly to the interdiction campaign by helping to capture major ports and air, uh, straits, which would not only hinder the transport and landing of enemy, airborne, uh, enemy seaborne report, for, reinforcements, but also assure Soviet access to the open ocean. Now, what I love about this book is that it has that in, and then almost the next chapter. Well, not next chapter. Let's see. Geographic problems. So two chapters on. We're now into the... Uh, three chapters on. Baltic Fleet. And then... Four chapters on. We're into the West African Naval Contingent. It, uh, it has this. The Soviet presence in Angolan ports enhances Soviet naval capabilities in the South Atlantic, with the goal of improving and expanding the Soviet Union's own political position in the world command and world community and increasing its ability to change the international political system. These new capabilities create the potential for a Soviet interdiction of Western oil tankers and other commercial ships. Almost half of all US oil still comes from the Cape of Good Hope, and according to a senior NATO intelligence officer, 80% of NATO nations' oil and 70% of their strategic materials move along the West African coast to Europe. Locating Soviet naval and naval air forces in Angolia gives them the ability to monitor the north, uh, the north and south Atlantic. Likewise, the access to Angola benefits Soviet naval and merchant fleet activities. Great extends the range of the Soviet Navy and gives it a forward logistics based operations along the West African coast. So merchant ships have brought in large amounts of arms and other military equipment, which are either offloaded in Angola or are transshipped to other areas of Africa where the Soviets are supporting insurgent activities. In addition, Soviet naval ships that are en route or to, to or from the Pacific usually stop at Lowanda to refuel, resupply, or simply show the flag. In this vein, the Soviet Navy has made numerous visits to many of the ports in the west coast of Africa, and most of them have been staged out of Luanda. If you're forward basing, you're capable of doing things with your surface ships. 
out of the range of aircraft because where are the most NATO aircraft concentrated? In the North Atlantic. Well, actually in Europe. Sri Lanka. I've been searching for books on naval steam boilers and engines. Cannot find anything. Can, can, can you think of anything? Um, oh, good lord. There's a 1912 Stoker's Manual. I'm going through my book list. Marine Boilers, Questions and Answers, Marine Engineering Series, uh, published in 1990 by GTH Flanagan, is fairly decent. But that's a, that's a book mostly for someone who's actually being trained to operate marine boilers. And I have read that one. Um, uh, Flanagan. <sighs> the historic one. The historic one, which I have got, again, which is marine, uh, modern American marine engines, boilers and screw propellers, their design and construction showing present. Um, let's see. I have got somewhere... A book which looks like this, which is about marine engines and boilers. Um, it's a classic reprint, and it has all the information in. It's it's again, it's a pretty technical read, but it's good. But you have to read it, and you have to be prepared to spend a lot of time looking through it. I will find the other one like it, and I will show it to you at some point. Probably next brew ships. What did the RN think of the assets class? They liked them, but they didn't want them. They thought they were very good for the Americans because they thought they were good for the Pacific. They didn't think they were good for what the British needed. It's one of those interesting scenarios. You can, it, it, Today, we have these uh, false things where people start going, ah, well, this carrier is better than that carrier. 
And in that period, they would actually go, well, no, that carrier is a very good carrier, but that's not suitable for our needs. And the Americans didn't want to build a British-style carrier. They Their closest was the Midways. And the British didn't want to build an American-style carrier. The closest was the Maltas. In that, the British were looking always at, the, as I've talked about, the pace of operations, the constant flow of operations, even when they were looking at wanting to have a more of an alpha strike capability. They were always looking at the flow of operations. And the Americans were always looking at the strike capacity, even when they wanted to maintain the flow of operations. Pardon me there. Uh, if I'm doing a World War II seaplanes, I'd have to look through my books. I would. I'd have to. Um, but yeah, uh, you will find it in the UK, History Vanguard, it's priced at £15.76. It's by Charles, e Charles W. Copeland and Charles E. Emery. I've got it, I've read it, I think someone's nicked it, in terms of my books. And in America it's priced at $19.09. It's very precise. And currently, I'm looking at a book and trying to convince myself I don't need to buy it because I've got a tax bill in this month I need to pay, so I do not need to buy it, but it's Strategy and the Sea, Essays in Honour of John B. Haddendorf, and it was published in 2016, and I've managed to forget to buy it so far. It's now 75 quid in hardcover, and I keep looking at it going, it's so tempting, but I have a tax bill in this month. It's so tempting, but I have a tax bill in this month. It's a big tax bill. Have you read Velikovsky? Vel Vel I think I have, but I would have to check the books. Because I've read quite a lot of Russian authors recently. And I've been reading other ones before that. So, Dog Boats at War. I love talking about this book. And I like to bring it up because lots of people forget these little ships. And I like a book which is entirely about these little ships. And I plan on doing in my series, which is, you know, I'm doing sort of a series of 45,000 word books, which are going to be put onto Kindle and other e-readers. And the reason I'm doing e-readers is because then I can do it all myself and not have to deal with publishers. And I won't have some strange editing decisions where people think that you can only have budgets in pounds. You can't, under a treaty system, have a budget limitation in weight. And, um, yeah. But there again. I didn't pick that up. Well, I might have, I don't know. I can't remember. <sighs> the whole thing is, if I can be a complete control freak if I want to be over the production of the books, if I do them all myself. And, yeah. That's what I want to do. So that's under this year's plan. As winter drew towards spring, the talk in the flotillas turned occasionally towards the probability of a second front being launched in this summer. But where and when? It was now a matter of record that behind the scenes the staff planners were already busy with dispositions and preparations in coastal forces. More and more dog boats were joining new flotillas, with boat numbers creeping up towards 750. Some flotillas were prepared for mine layings, but the East Coast flotillas were to continue in their relentless battles of the elements for some time to come. And in the Channel, the great priority was the shortly to become the protection of the south coast ports against marauding e-boats intent on laying mines on the, in the swept of channels. On 22nd 25th February, 
Doe's old warriors, 609 and 610 of the 50th flotilla, were involved with the destroyer HMS Graf in repelling an attack by 15 e-boats on the convoy route near Smith's Knoll. Garth sank one e-boat, 549, and the dogboats had a brief action which had apparently no result other than to turn the e-boats back without contact contacting the convoy. Two lights later, 617, 621 and 629 of the 55th, with Eggington and Viver Vivian, had a similar brush, but this time Bradford moved to, uh, across to Umidon and caught the e-boats returning. They intercepted two groups, one of four and then one of six, and secured hits on at least four of them. The returning fire was spasmodic, but the unit suffered one fatal casualty. It is, of course, futile to generalise on such matters, but the crew of the dogboats always considered that once they were within range of the e-boats, they could get the upper hand in gunnery quite quickly. And what the fire from e what the, uh, and that the fire from the e-boats was often high and wide. Such confidence was a great help when pressing home an attack, however tenuously it was based. March was the beginning of the hectic and successful period for the dogboat flotillas, and indeed for all the coastal forces MTBs, because this narrative, by definition, is concerned with the dogboats, little is said of the work of the shore boat, the short boats. But apart from the fact that in the winter months the shorts were unable to operate as constantly as the dogs in the poor weather, they were all they were being very successful in many attacks, led as ever by inspiring senior officers such as MacDonald, Arnold Foster, and Trelawney. Were the successors to Hitchens, Dickens, Richards, and Horn. More were to engage in the heady days ahead. On the 6th and 7th of March, it was the turn of the newly formed 53rd Flotilla of the Dogboats, under their senior officer, Lieutenant Commander D.H.E. McCowan, to fight a spirited battle in their first opportunity of contact with the enemy. McGowan's flotilla had three boats still with their MGB armament and no tubes. His own 639 and the 693, 695 under Lieutenant D.L.W. McFarlane, and 689 under Lieutenant W. Messenger. The other two boats were true MTBs, 694, Lieutenant J. Colville, and 690, Lieutenant RDF Martlow. The unit's orders were to patrol along the Dutch coast from Egmond south to the Hook. As they approached Yamudden in an arrow formation and at 10 knots, they sighted three trawlers at four miles range. Visibility was extreme and without such some substitute, fuge, surprise was going to be impossible. McGann decided to close Yamudden and, if possible, to pass his unit off as e-boats. When they were very close to the entrance, they found that there was a cluster of about 12 enemy vessels to seaward, trawlers, our boats, and a gun coaster, and two merchant vessels. It seemed that the convoy was forming up. Showing great coolness, McGowan led his three gun boats closer in, there by now only 500 yards from shore batteries at Yamudan. He then sent the two MTBs to attack the uh, merchantmen. With the aid of some imaginary e-boat call signs and some deliberately bad morse from an ill-trained lamp, the range was reduced to a mere 200 yards and enabled the first broadside, with complete surprise, to devastate the gun coaster and also to damage two of the R boats before they even opened fire and apply. To confuse the MEC even further, several small enemy craft came out of Imuden. After attacking the R boats and receiving some damage, McGowan's inshore group opened fire on the trawlers and secured hits before they disengaged. They could hardly miss at such short range. The two MTBs fired their torpedoes and considered that the, that the smaller of the merchant vessels was hit and seemed to be sinking. They went on and engaged the trawlers and our boats before 690 received a hit in the engine room from a shore battery. Only prompt action by the engine room crew extinguished the resulting fire and enabled a withdrawal. The enemy, still thoroughly confused, continued firing at each other with the increasing success for some time, all a byproduct of the daring and Totally unexpected inshore attack so close to the port. Five to six dog boats were damaged, but only 695 received significant casualties, with when early in the action she was hit on the bridge and both the pilot, Sub Lieutenant JWG Moorish, and the CCF NOR's newly appointed gunnery officer, Lieutenant DT Wickham RN, were killed. The same shell wounded the CO, First Lieutenant Coxon, and in the trauma, 695 round 693. But fortunately, neither boat was disabled. The CO, Douglas McFarlane, ignored his wounds and brought the 695 back to harbour five hours later before collapsing. Not surprisingly, he was awarded a DSC, and his Coxon, Petty Officer S.J. Mears, a DSM. It's a very good book. Do it, do it.
Carlos, retake out reacquisition. Legacy code is a swear word in many long run long running MMORPGs. Mm-hmm. Agreed, Captain C4. So the patron choices. Well, let's see what they are. Let's see for starters how many boats votes are in. Uh, 108 votes were cast. A hundred and eight votes were cast. Let's see the results. We have a couple of nine votes. And I think there are winners. Our winners therefore are Germany does not invade Colin Cameron's Germany does not invade Belgium in nineteen fourteen, so UK does not declare war. How does it affect the Royal Navy? Ambition. French interwar carrier aviation. Why did the French Navy not more fully embrace carrier aviation after World War One? There are a large number of sevens and eights. I will say that. This is the trouble when you have quite so many good options. I do sometimes feel bad putting them all in and going... Perhaps I should filter them down to allow, you know, more people to just sort of vote to make it more clear-cut. But then I go, well, hang on there, they've given all these options, they should all deserve a chance. So the winners are the two nines, which is Colin Cameron's, Germany does not invade Belgium in 1914, so UK does not declare war, how does it affect the RN? And Bichon, the French interwar carrier aviation. Why did the French Navy not more fully embrace carrier aviation after World War I? I will... I think we'll do Germany first, because I think the French interwar will do second. Thanks, sorry, that's some reasonably good pronunciation of Dutch names there, Dr. Locke. Occasionally I do okay with Dutch, mainly because I had a very, very good Dutch friend when I was younger, who still sends me chocolates to this day. We are at primary school together, he sends me chocolates, I send him... Well, I used to send him licorice because apparently he really liked it. I hate licorice in the UK, but he likes it. Um, so, you know, I sent, used to send him licorice, but now it's sort of changed and I tend to send him things like World was Original. Because apparently that's what he wants. Richards, are e boats. E boats are Schnell boots. Yes, the torpedo boats. Yeah, Navy Boilers by Robert M. Lanfham is a good one.
Not certain why did Destroyer Leader fall out of favor? Mostly because the Destroyer just grew in size to the point that all Destroyers became Destroyer Leaders and then basically cruisers. Oh, really small boats. Torpedo boats often used in ASW as well as small gun to destroy destroyers. Yeah. Small gun DDs used during the Adriatic from 1944 to 44. At least one boat served under multiple flags. Many vessels served under multiple flags. They kind of went round and round and round. Schnell boot is what they tend to call themselves. Yeah, what they are actually called. We call them e-boats. And the fact is the... Germans also did have the R boats, which were the small, slightly smaller vessels, which are, for, are often forgotten in history. Q ships, commerce raiders, and convoys. Because of what's coming out Tuesday, which is geared, of course, this has been interesting to me, and I've been going through this. I have to admit, tomorrow's short will be at a slightly different time than it normally is, because. There's no point producing at 7 a.m. when there's no long patrol coming out at 7 p.m. So it's going to be out later tomorrow morning. But, um, yeah. I am going to keep doing a short. I'm going to try and do a short most days of the week. Because I've decided I can... Uh, most days I can probably get a 60 second video out. While still doing all the other work. Because it's only a few minutes of work. It's about half... It's, I'd say for a 60 second video to sort it out properly and do it properly is about half an hour. And I can probably manage that each day, and it's probably sensible to do so because if I'm getting a short out every day, then I'm keeping myself up on the logarithm with YouTube, which helps with getting new subscribers. Which is fun because my aunt's now made the target 15,000. Hi, Anuk. That's one. How to catch a Dutch sky? Put a bowl of black licorice on the table. Mm hmm. I'm sorry, wasn't UK's involvement one on all but inevitable? Um. Not as inevitable as it might necessarily seem. It was theoretically inevitable, but um, the British were sufficiently divided that if you don't invade Belgium, then it's going to be more of an issue for a British government to get involved. This one, how long is the script for about for a video of about an hour long for you? Go a few days. I want to explore making a video for. I'm getting an idea how long the script should be. Okay, that, you have to remember I'm a uni lecturer, so my script is different. Well, I, shall, I, I hope you will get that, Vanguard. In fact, if you're not on... I, here's my personal bet for you, History Vanguard. I want you on 2,000 subs by the end of the year, if not more. Okay, you do great work. I like your stuff, and I like your style. Um, yeah, you do have to accept the vets in my family. The vets are contra- it's part of the fa- it's it just- it's family culture, don't you just- yeah, it's just life. Um, I know Kaja's channel growth is channel growth and logarithm, but I might have to turn off the bell as the shorts are going to continue, as I can't do TikTok length history. Ah, <laughs> oh. you do realise you can select- you can go to the bell and select whether you hear all notifications or if it's um, notifications for things you like. For You can say, uh, say no, no, no shorts, apparently. I'm not sure if that's just for Prime members. But I was reading that somewhere. It's either something you can do or it's something you're going to be able to do. You'll be able to select whether you get wh what you get. Because there's one channel which I would like to just get the shorts of because they're longs I don't enjoy. But the 60 second videos I find funny. Because 60 second videos involve a corgi being funny. And I enjoyed a 60 second video of a corgi being funny. I don't want their long patrol. I recommend. 
So what I was going to say, that was good, as my script is a load of bullet points. So for an hour long video, mine will be, for each slide, I will have about 10 bullet points. And for an hour long video, I will tend to work out that I need roughly four and a half minutes a slide. So I will tend to allocate as if I'm doing four minutes a slide for an hour long. And so therefore I will have 15 slides, so I'll have 150 bullet points. Definitely. Barring some miraculous YouTuber logarithm influx and new subs, I sadly doubt it will be doable. That is why I have to do the shorts, because this is going to sound terrible, but the shorts drive in far more new viewers. The long, the recorded videos are far more enjoyed, according to analytics, by the people who are turning to my channel. The shorts are where I recruit and get new viewers. On average, uh, for every new viewer who views who starts off by seeing a recorded video, a longer video first, I will see a free new viewer see a short first. So, here we go. Q ships. The British Honourable East Indian Company had been the largest ship owner in the history of the world until the 19th century. In August 1914, all this had changed in the Hamburg America Line, with its fleet of some 500 vessels, 75 services, Servicing 400, serving 400 ports and carrying over 400,000 passengers per annum had become the largest shipping corporation ever. This had been achieved from its founding in May 1847 with three smallish sailing ships. By the eve of the First World War, it owned well over a million tons of steamships. A similar story could be told for the, of the North German Lloyd Company. Its first Atlantic steamer was the Bremen, built by Laird of Greenock in 1858. The wealth of the company's passenger trade was such that in the year 1897, they were able to launch the twin-screw Kaiser Wilhelm de Gross. This ship had a speed of over 22 knots, was able to outrun the Campania Lusitania, Luciana, and for the first time, take the Blue Riband off the Atlantic from Britain. This fourth final liner was later to play a noteworthy part of the story of commerce raiding. It is worth recalling that, that, at this time, the German Merchant Navy's policy was to rely principally upon liner trades. Germany was able to build costly mammoth passenger steamers, often quite capable of breaking records, because she had attracted a considerable share of the emigrant traffic from the continent of Europe, rather as Holland had built up an imposing mercantile fleet in the 17th century based upon herring fisheries. 200 years later, Germany created a superb commercial navy on the backs of poor emigrants from Russia. At one period, there was an average yearly emigration of about 113,000 Germans to the United States of America, but this figure had declined by about two-thirds in the decade which ended in 1914. To compensate, the steam, a stream of emigrants wishing to change their homes in Russia for habitat, habitations in North America steadily increased from an average of 2,000 per annum in the decade which ended in 1974 to the best part of 200,000 per annum shortly before the outbreak of the First World War. In 1894, the German government, in its wisdom, established what, when, uh, what were to be known as the control stations at various positions along the frontier of the Russia. The original aim of these stations was purported to be the prevention of the spread of cholera by Russian emigrants passing through Germany. But the interesting point is that the building and management of the control stations was placed in the hands of the Hamburg, America, and North German Lloyd shipping companies, arguably a form of privatization. Be that as it may, the companies used the stations in such a profitable manner that it was extremely difficult for any potential emigrant to get through unless he expressed the intention to travel by one of the two shipping lines involved. Government legislation made it even more difficult and costly for emigrant passengers to reach the United States except in German ships. Facilities such as through rates, over the continental railways and the geographical position of German ports contrived to steer hordes of travellers into German American ships and thus ensure a steady flow of revenue. By way of contrast, the British Isles dependent for their, uh, dependent for their supplies and nervous trade largely on what is known as the Tramp Steamer, a name which scarcely does so much justice to the many beautifully built and well-founded steamships of the moderate tonnage which made their contribution to the British Merchant Navy. It was these vessels which had been keeping their countries, factories, institutions, finances and actual living bodies from withering away, while Germany concentrated on the ocean-going traffic passenger ships, especially in the Atlantic. 
60% of British tonnage was made up of tramp steamers and, near, and a mere 40% of liners. This loose mobile superiority came about because British shipping had become the principal carrier of the world, just as one period of history Dutch vessels were the great wagoners of the sea. The British tramp fleet amply demonstrated its value when the Royal Navy demanded large numbers of auxiliaries after July 1914, and extremely heavy pressure was exerted upon cargo-carrying steamers for maintaining supplies at home. The fast Atlantic passenger ships could never have been and had enough space available. It's fun, and it's a good read. I would agree, History Vanguard. I would say your research is very good, and I enjoy it. Just long, the shorts are more like traders, really. Yes, and that's what I treat them as. When I'm talking about things like tomorrow, I think I'm doing Nelson's funeral, because that is the night for January. And so it's going to be an introduction to the topic, a 60 seconds of burst of this is a little goblet of history to get, make you interested, and I hope you go and look for more. To be honest, Fuji Smith, I can understand why some people think that, but actually, it's going to sound strange. Most of the people I know who watch shorts and enjoy shorts most are um, quite all of my actually more senior academic friends, professor level, etc. And they enjoy shorts because it gives them a 60 second idea or something. And they go through, they are very heavily curate the channels they get in their shorts because you know you can block channels and you can say don't subscribe to this channel so they literally have 60 second shorts from only history channels and they just go through them and they just use it as a way to sort of almost cleanse their palate or to think for, to hear other ideas and just quickly use a springboard point so yeah there are some good advantages on I understand that, Verdun, and I don't consider you curmudgeon. I consider it perfectly natural. We all have the different choices we want to do of what the things we do. I, as said, I like the shorts because I see them as an introduction, a little bit of a taster of history. And I like that as an idea. I like that. I like doing the concepts in the hot tub. I like that as a theme. I like doing the little bursts on ships. I like doing the ships in 60 seconds. I'm going to keep doing those, definitely. And I like doing the battles and some of the events in 60 seconds. Just a quick a sort of taster to get the people interested in, 60, in history. I see a short, to be honest. My approach to shorts is they are this part of a book. They're reading the back cover. So that's how I approach a short. For me, a, a short is how I write the back cover of my book. The information I put on that. To, it's to try, it's to encourage you to read the book. To go and look up the history, and so that's how I approach them. But I do understand not everyone wants to sit around reading the back covers of books. Sorry, Doctor, if I may, what's the over under here of under of him being from one of the Hollands? Mm? If you're asking where my friend comes from, yes. You are right. He is his actual family home where he grew up 
is not far from where one of the original Admiralties was. This one, on a mental health note, shorts are good if you're having injuries or thoughts. The subject changed quickly enough that the mind doesn't have time to develop the injuries or thoughts. Hmm. I agree with that, Fuji. And as I said, I like to do long ones and I like to do shorts. It's basically, I, I like to do both. Yes, they have said they'll be monetizing short soon. Actually, I think they already are. There is a debate going on between me and Drac in about whether they are or not. But I think you get some. If I think if YouTube Premium viewers watch shorts, I think you get some money from it. But I could be wrong. Enjoy the laundry. <laughs> right, so, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, it's time to be on to the next book for me. Mm -hmm. Japanese Carriers and Victory in the Pacific. The Emoto Option by Martin Sansfield. Now, this is one of the things which, if you read the back, it's kind of interesting. One of the first books to focus on the pre-war controversy between building more big battleships or converting to aircraft carriers as the capital ships of the future. An Asian power challenges the might of USA and the colonial empires and loses the contest but comes out all right in the Cold War. Aftermath. Examines much overlooked intelligence such as the long genesis of Japan's so-called Shadow Fleet that along with the super battleships cluttered launch facilities when these could have been devoted to keel up, uh, to keel up fast fleet carrier production. The first analytical look at what major launch facilities were actually available in Japan. Now, I like this book. I find it interesting. But I do, to an extent, disagree with one of the premises. And one of the premises the premises of this book is that you can avoid you could not Japan would not could not could have avoid, not built battleships pretty much and that comes through to an extended section of it and I don't think they can because I don't think the world is so clear cut and as I've me and Drac have both said and various others have people said the world if the Soviet Union had carried on building and had built Stalin's plan, and this was a discussion point, one of the other options on the patron, which was, got seven votes, Stalin gets over from ruin, Stalin gets most of or all of his dream fleet, what would a likely NATO Western ally in the building program look like in response? It would have been involved building battleships in the 1950s. It would have been. Would it have continued building them in the 60s and 70s? I don't know. I don't know how technology evolves under those circumstances, but it would have been a very different scenario than what we were faced with. The battleship was not as clear-cut loser of World War II as it is portrayed as being today. It's kind of like the story of the battle cruiser. If you recently read quite a lot of the mainstream of, and I hate using the term mainstream, but the main thrust histories, the general histories of warfare and history in the interwar period, You will hear the thing that the battle cruiser ends as a ship in World War One. It's it's that's its end, but it isn't. And yes, it evolves. And yes, it's the fast battleship which appears in World War Two, which has more armor, a better armor than the battle cruiser did. But in many ways, that's a battle cruiser rebranded. A fast battleship, in many ways, is a battle cruiser rebranded. If you look at the evolution of where battle cruisers were going, anyway. And the fact is, the British were building battle cruisers after World War One, so. If the primary person a nation who lost battle cruisers in World War One and had had the most to begin with and have been fighting with them is building more, that suggests it's not clear cut that those things are now pointless and useless, doesn't it? It suggests these things are more complicated. 
And it's the same with carry aviation. We look at back at it now after the what's happened in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s today, and we go, yes, carry aviation was definitely the, you know, it's the romping, stomping, massive, far away success. You look back in the period, though, in the 1940s and 50s, and it's, it's, they're not so sure. They've just been through World War II. They've seen what's happened, and there are still designs going around and still work going on, because if the Soviet Union produces any of those battleships and battle cruisers which they're building, you could guarantee a response would turn up from the Western dockyards. And the moment those the responses only disappear as an option when the Soviets stop building them. Not because they are so confident that their carriers, etc., can beat them. Basically, there's a limit to how fast you can make a ship. There is a limit to cost effectiveness of how fast you can make a ship. And at a certain point, you can't make a battle cruiser any faster. So your only option is to use the, to give it more armor and give it more protection, which makes it into a fast battleship. And you build it differently. And that's the thing. That's the point, as I always try and make, is the real difference between a battle cruiser and a battleship, and along that spectrum, is the amount of armor coverage they've got, and also the internal subdivision and the way they're formed. Whether they are a cruiser subdivision, or they're a battleship subdivision. A battleship subdivision looks like a honeycomb. A cruiser subdivision looks like a, a wine glass box. Hi, Wayne. Take care. But it's still a very good book to read. The explosion came shortly after noon on a foggy June day in 1943 at the anchorage of Hash Hashirishima Island in Japan's Inland Sea. It was heard as a dull thud in communities around Hiroshima Bay. Close by, some thought a volcano blown its top. Mountains shrouded the boom from nearby Kyo Naval Arsenal and the Antijima Naval Academy tucked away in the coves by the near end of the bay. Approaching the anchorage surged the battleship Nagato. Erstwhile, flagship of the combined fleet. From its bridge recited a white flash in the midst. In the mist. Minutes later, a radio call came from an anchorage. Mutsu just blew up. Transmission came from the captain of the battleship Fuso, which was moored by it to a buoy a thousand yards away from the incident. Mutsu was seen to jackknife, the front end immediately capsizing to starboard as far as its tall pagoda mast would allow in the shallow water. Shorter rear end bobbed up to the perpendicular before sinking uh, more but slowly. The Fuzo's captain ordered rescue boats away. Of 1,474 men aboard the Mutsu, only 353 survived, and a mere 13 of the 153 flying cadets and their instructors visited uh, visiting on a familiarization mission. mission. Next from Japan's order of battle was, only, was one of only two battleships with 16-inch guns. They had been the pride of the Japanese Navy in the pre-war years, the mighty sisters Nagato and Mutsu, alternating as flagships of the combined fleet. The only other 16 inches of their day were HMS Nelson Rodney of the Royal Navy and the free ship Colorado class, the U.S. Navy. All seven were built between the last years of the First World War and the 1922 Washington Naval Disarmament Treaty. Nelson Rodney were not built before the Washington Naval Disarmament Treaty. They were built after it. I'm sorry. That's a very... They were ordered December 1922, laid down December 1922, launched 25th of October, 19, September 1925 and December 1925, commissioned August 1927 and December 1927. They were not under construction before the Washington Naval Treaty was agreed in 1922. Otherwise, it's a very good book. The irony for those aboard of the Fuso must have been the how Mutsu had just returned from war operations in the South Pacific. It alone of the pre-war dreadnoughts had entered the combat, zo uh, combat zone. The other five spent much of the war in the inland sea. So much uh, so, spent so much of the war in the inland sea that they were disparaged of the Hashirijima fleet. What had happened was the magazine of sea turrets, the inner or stern pair, 
It exploded with such force that the contiguous structure disintegrated and the ship broke in, itself, uh, broke in half. There have ensured many poetus mortems. The inquiry at the time being conducted the most secretly. Was it an Allied submarine, the Japanese asked themselves, or did the new anti-aircraft incendiary projectiles for the big guns somehow manage to cook off inside the magazine? A more recent investigation has suggested a failure to renew all the original wiring during the massive makeover, lasting from September 1934 to January 1935. Much of the original wiring dated from the ship's construction between 1918 and 1921. This theory gained sustenance from eyewitness reports of smoke seen rising from a location just forward of the turret, where the aircraft scouts were launched. Could this fire have so heated the interior of the turret as to have set off the highly volatile black powder primers, they pondered? On a battleship, bags of black powder are used to fire the projectiles. But they are notoriously sensitive and so are invariably stored in a separate magazine, not just left lying around. The Japanese Board of Inquiry tried to pass off the incident as an act of sabotage by a suicidal seaman under investigation for theft. His post was inside the turret. That outcome may well have inspired the US Navy to propose a similar verdict following the inquiry into a turret explosion on the border of US Iowa during the peacetime exercise of Puerto Rico in April 1989. I doubt it did. In the nicest way, the idea of blaming everything on a disgruntled sailor has long, long been there because it's a nice way of excusing yourself of any blame. It's an interesting book to read. Calling the Iowa Bismarck, the Iowa class Bismarck sized battleships is not something I'm sure I would use as a reference point, though. But it is an interesting book to read. It's one of Pen and Sword's newer ones. And it's, yeah, it's got some ideas in there. I was thinking the other day about how I write a video script. I write the whole script. It's sounding more like a pa like paper than talking points from that, and turn it into a video. Hmm. I have learnt my way over years of being a lecturer. I have the bullet points, and I can tick them off as I go. So that's how I work it. I honestly probably wouldn't do it this way. Uh, f if I was doing it from scratch, I'd probably write more. I'd be inclined to write a script, but I do with bullet points. And when I do TV work, I don't even use bullet points. I have my notes. I've read them before the questions. I don't really know what the questions are going to be, but I have an idea from my notes because they tell they give you to what sort of areas they're going to be talking about. So you go and look into them. And then you listen to the question, and you answer them. Carrier Vision 1949 for US and Japan is still generally biplanes of a character. I expect if war happens then, the carrier is still used, but not seen as we do. It would be different, but it might not be as different as you think. Uh, that book, by the way, was um, Japanese Carriers and Victory in the Pacific. It's from Pen and Sword, and it's by Martin Sansfield. Go on, Chris Duckett. Modern 155mm shells can be guided. What would be the impact of a 16 shell that can be guided? Uh, not very good to be on the receiving end of. Not at all good to be on the receiving end of. Captain Single. A bit of a wet finger in the air, but if Yamato had IJ and 100mm and both was 40mm, could it have forced a battleship fight, and how would that have changed post war perception of battleships? Probably not against the weight of aircraft it was engaged by, but. The thing is, because there is a case of sheer numbers, and that's one of the things with the Yamato scenario, it's a case of it's a battleship out on its own. 
and the British and the Americans were both listening, looking, and the Soviets were going, well, we wouldn't send a battleship out on something without air support. That's part of how you operate. The two together are far stronger than either, either one individually. But the Japanese have an option. But if there had been a battleship fight, I don't think that really changes much post-war perception. Because most of post-war perception doesn't come from the 1940s and 50s. Most of post-war perception comes from people reimagining things and putting things back on there from the 1970s and 80s onwards. I said no front, considering that people believe that the UK needed permission to finish Hood on the treaty. Mm. Yeah. Basically, the Hood takes the place of the third 16 inch ship which the British could have got. Major Fernand, ooh, size matters. Not as Yoda might say, but it does well, it does, but, sh well, it says, well, it does, but sh this mark is so inefficient that, yeah, yeah, you don't want to use Bismarck as a, um, if you're using Bismarck as your, uh, your relevation, uh, your, um, point of reference for battleship design, then I would presume you have some issues going on. But it's a good, it's a worthwhile read. Uh, there are bits in it which I find I do not agree with. But I'm a histo another historian. If I agree with everything in a book, it's probably something I wrote, and even then, that's not that's rare. That I disagree with some things I wrote in my own book because it's stuff I can prove versus stuff which I think. Now, the book: Men, Money, and Diplomacy: The Evolution of British Strategic Foreign Policy, 1919 to 1926. This is one of those books which, if you're interested in it, it's worthwhile, but it is expensive. But it is worthwhile if you're interested in it. 1919 to 1926. It's... Again, I don't agree with everything in it. I really don't. But it's a great starting point and introduction to what's going on in 1919 to Substitution and the fate of RAF policy were at an impasse. For Britain demanded defence economies in Iraq, criticised the Royal Air Force for failing to replace the army, but questioned Trenchard's scheme for Iraq. Churchill broke this impasse in December 1920. He first gave Wilson's proposals to Cabinet that Britain could hold all Iraq with three divisions, costing £25 million per year, or withdraw to Basra, requiring one division and £8 million. The Cabinet rejected these alternatives, wishing to retain all Iraq, but more cheaply. Oh, great. Do more with less. It gave the colonial officers control over Iraq and Palestine, and that mean, it means the, the means to defend them. As colonial secretary, Churchill adopted the RAF system. The captain agree, uh, cabinet agreed that the RAF could, would uh, control Iraq at 5 to 6 million per year, with garrison fall, uh, falling from three divisions to eight Indian battalions, four British armoured car companies, and eight RAF squadrons by spring of 1922. At act strength, RAF control would begin in October 1922. The cabinet also approved the first air route from Cairo to Baghdad. Trenchard's proposals for Iraq had paid dividends, for this indication that the RAF could lead to defence economies profoundly impressed the government. In 1922-23, the RAF received most of the Colonial Office grant from the Middle Eastern Defence, which alone prevented reductions in its strength. Conversely, this discretion crippled army policy. The War Office had continuously urged the British commitments should not be cut to match its strength. It wanted Britain to make these cuts by abandoning Persia, Constantinople and Iraq, and by concentrating for a final offensive in Ireland. Although Britain evacuated Persia, it elected to hold Constantinople, uh, Constantinople, enter negotiations in Ireland and control Iraq through the RAF. This new balance between strength and commitments had one devastating result. Whereas in 1920 the army had too little strength to meet its commitments, in 1921 it had too few commitments to justify its strength. By early 1921, Chetwold noted that the army might have to cut the expeditionary force by one division in 1922 unless the Treasury were to be a little bit more liberal with us. 
That was too vastly unlikely, and by summer 1921 the situation worsened. The decision about Persian and Iraq rendered a division surplus to requirements. In 1922-3, that, uh, that on, on Ireland would eliminate the normal Irish garrison of one, de one division, which was included in expeditionary force. That force and overseas garrisons alike would have, have a spare division. Given the financial situation, the obviously solution on the current war system was to eliminate them both. The War Office recognised the danger. It opposed any reductions in fighting units, although it believed that, if necessary, support services and the territorial army could be halved. However, Wilson disliked this prospect and knew that much of the army's problems stemmed from the scheme to control Iraq through hot air aeroplanes and Arabs. He held that this could not defend Iraq against attack from Turkey or Russia. Britain could do so only by reinforcing Iraq, yet as any troops removed from there might be eliminated... No reinforcements would exist and debacle would be certain. However, the army had the surplus of strength to garrison Iraq and by doing so could reduce the scope for cuts. Thus in July, Wilson demanded that Iraq either be evacuated except for Basra or garrisoned with 22 battalions, including at least seven British ones. The cabinet rejected these ideas, but the War Office tried to alter this decision by attempting to wreck the RAF system in Iraq. It refused to provide any forces for that system, including armoured car units. Which, without which, it could would have been unworkable. Wilson thus alienated friendly officials, increased Wilson Churchill's hostility to army policy, and get gained nothing. Trenchard prepared to control Iraq without the army, particularly by forming armored car units under the RAF. While Churchill also gave the RAF control over Palestine. The Iraq garrison from 1922 to three was increased only marginally to two British and seven Indian battalions instead of just eight Indian ones. The army cuts of 1922 stem from these decisions over Iraq, about Iraq and Ireland. The army could not have altered the latter, the latter decision, except by winning the Irish War, but with a different policy in 1919-1920, it could have, uh, could have established its own substitution system in Iraq. The Irish decision would have forced reductions, but these were magnified by the army's concurrent loss of Iraq, or a role in the funds which had justified and financed the British division. Under the Cardwell system, every unit left in Iraq could have saved itself and another from elimination, had the army created its own substitution scheme, in which it would have lost some conventional units, but not so many, it would also have preserved 33% of the strength cut in 1922, losing only those units wholly recruited from Southern Ireland, and in turn would have increased its mechanised forces. Instead, the RAF fed at the expense of the army's conventional and mechanised units. By 1921, the army reorganises mechanical forces, develops reliable equipment, and decided to replace four cavalry regiments with four tank battalions between 1922 and 24. Wilson recognised that the modern weapons would soon cause something of a revolution in the army's preparations for war, and other things being equal, the army will win, which, ha which has most uh, surprises in store for the enemy. He wanted experimental brigade manoeuvres to peep into the future so far as money will last. Although these manoeuvres were not overly progressive, they still studied the role of tanks and the aircraft weapons, anti-tank weapons and aircraft. It's a worthwhile book, but as I said, it is a very specialist procurement. Hot air. And airplanes and Arabs. I balloons. Oh, look, I saw one of your war factories appear on YouTube. Then you've seen more than me, because I haven't seen many of my war factory appearances yet. <laughs> I think I've I've seen my mysteries of the deep, but I haven't seen any of my war factory appearances yet. Oh. And that's all the books for today. I didn't have it, and none of my new books have arrived yet, so this was there was going to be no new books today, and no new books. I thought I'll just do random and do stuff which I've actually been reading for fun with this the last few days. So these are what the books which I have been reading for the last couple of weeks, basically, for fun. And I thought, well, I'll stick them up. And by the way, please note, historians actually like books we disagree with. Because it gives us ideas for our own books. I wish. Anuk, I wish. Mysteries of the Deep is back in German streaming. <laughs> oh, good lord. 
You see, I, I heard some of the options for the German dubbing for that. And I, so, there, there was this, um, uh, lady who was so friendly and brought, who, who was, uh, they were talking about, who apparently brought cookies, etc. whenever they were doing the dubbing. And I hope she would dub me. I'm sure I got a guy, but, you know, I'd, I'd like the cookie lady, because then I'd known who to do, I'd have known something about the person dubbing me. Your German voice actor is weird. I'm so used to hearing you in English. <laughs> oh. You got a guy. I thought I did. Alex, which book title do you wish you had the idea for? I have a title in my head which is Water More Powerful Than Air, which is all about, supposedly about the, the change of steam, the change to steam over wind. But I haven't really worked out how well, the book I want to write for it, so it just sort of sits in my head. I don't know, where was the infrastructure in the UK had 96 able to build her but unable to fully support her? It was able to support her, just not able to support her worldwide. So, Britain had some infrastructure in the UK and in the Mediterranean, which could support a vessel the size of Hood. It just didn't have the infrastructure worldwide and didn't have enough of it, so it could support one ship, not a group of ships the same size. That's the reality of it. And because, that's because they were caught mid-upgrade. It's what happens sometimes. The weekly comments videos will start on on probably on Friday, but I am considering doing another of those this week because I'm considering doing one on Wednesday as well. I'm gonna have a go. I'm gonna be start recording. Basically, I'm gonna do comment response for the entire. I do, I do comment response videos. So I'm going to do, look at a sort of do comment response for the Christmas series videos. As I always do it for the week, the week before is the most popular one, but I haven't done it for this the Christmas period. So, yeah, I'm going to look at the Christmas period and I'm going to look at I, either which videos had the most comments or maybe I'll just do the top 100 comments or just 100 or something like that from the Christmas period. It's fun. It is fun. It is length for Hood more than anything else. Um, there are the limitations of the dry docks out of length, and you needed they needed to build longer ones. They really did. Oh, some patrons are getting things this, uh, this week. By the way, I am getting constant messages about stickers being on their way, so patron stickers should be showing up soon. Uh, Siglock, Alex, you, uh, you, saw, you, saw, you saw, sort of misread my question. Which book title, which was written by someone else, did you wish you had? had? Oh, Admirals. Andrew Lambert's book. Admirals. I've got another idea for a version of it, but it does sound like a derivative of it, which is Commodores. And I, 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 that's because Andrew's just taken the great, a great one, Admirals. Yay! Enjoy the stickers. I like them. Admittedly, I don't get to keep it. Any of the ones I get sent, I don't get to keep. My family mixed them all. But, you know, they're good. Who 
Good morning. I have narrowed my university list down to all across the country and one in Canada. My criteria: what degree do I, do I like in good disabled services area? Uh. St. Mary's University College Twickenham is very good for support and very good for history. It's where I did my bachelor's. And they're really, really nice little uni. And my advice mostly to students who are, especially students who are coming into university who may or may not have been away from home before and have got special needs to deal with, Smaller universities which have good teaching, uh, good good lecturers, but good support teams are a better choice usually than the bigger universities. Go to ones where you will be more of a name than a number. And I do not mean that as a derogative point, okay? I love teaching at all the universities. I teach at various different universities. But there are some universities I walk in, I have hun I have three, uh, 600 or something... Uh, sometimes we're a higher than that in a lecture. I would love to say I knew all my students, but I don't under those circumstances. And I have other unis I walk into where I have 40, 50 students in a group. And yeah, I know those students in a lecture. And it's going to reflect in the seminars. In the larger one, there'll be 20 to 30 students in each seminar. And again, I'll know those students are quite, or the seminar I actually lead myself. But the other uni, I might have 10, 12 in a seminar. It's going to get far more discussion time in. And they cost the same in fees as a rule. Man, um, quick question. Given that guns in the modern view is the most often about shore bombardment and fast support, why was the 8-inch autoloading gun for US destroyers dropped in the late 70s? Because people are short-sighted. And slightly moronic. Because 5-inch was enough. 8-inch would have been better, though. It's always good to go with more than enough. It gives you some advantages for going forward. So, so how long would it have taken to make dock around the world and sort of hood? Um, a few months. And honestly, in the nicest way, you can say you're doing dry dock upgrades. That's what you're doing. You're, do you're upgrading the docks and full sport facilities. And there's nothing the USA can do or agree about it. As long as you don't build the ship, you're just building the, the dry dock facilities. And, again, they can be cut for commercial purposes. All you need to do is have a few liners built, which serve the Australia run, which are about the same length as Hood, and suddenly you have a reason for having those dry docks built. Actually, oh yes, it says I'm getting a sticker and asking for my address. Could anyone describe the sticker so I can decide it's worth giving away? It's the channel logo. Well, hang on, one of them is. Both of them are, actually. It's quite a decent sticker. It's a decent size one as well. I don't I believe someone to say that the hood's cost was about nine billion over a lifetime. Uh, I'm presuming that cost was adjusted for various things into modern funds because uh, if I'm not mistaken her build cost was yet uh... I'm just checking my own sources. She costs six million to build. And whilst, yes, a few upgrades she goes through in life, it basically costs about ooh, probably 18 million in total. Um, and her rebuilds because of inflation, etc. That's still only 24 million. 
So, for her to get to 9 billion, that's a lot, unless it's adjusted for some kind of point of which going, in money, 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 it would have cost 9 billion over her lifetime. Um, but actually, it would probably have been slightly cheaper individually for ships if you'd had more of them, because you'd have been able to do things over ships, but as her three sisters were being quite different to her, it might not have actually affected her costs overall. And, um, and is it realistic the will go back at some point for the heavy gun support ship, or is it missiles better sort of job and the five inches good enough? Uh, wait until they work out how quickly you go through missiles, and even NATO would go through missiles in a Ukraine-style so modern war scenario. They might well get them. So anyway, yes, I went to uni with hundreds of students in my course. I fell miserably. Then I went small one and succeeded. I've gone to all three. Small, medium, large. I've taught at all of them, and I can say all have their advantages and disadvantages. It depends on what you want out of it. But I would say as a rule, with if I was dealing with a student who had what I would call educational needs, different uh, differential educational needs, I, those sort of disabilities or those things, uh, small to medium-sized unis is usually better. If they have the support things in place. Not all small unis do have the support facilities in space to be able to help them. And to help you, so you don't go to those. But some, St. Mary's, which is heavily supported by various other organisations which pump funds into it, does. And it looks after them. Fushi Smith, hello. Uh, why did, again, why did Axis ship, capital ships perform so poorly modelled? Yamato, Bismarck, Gilo, Shiro did not get much done for the resources they cost. Well, let's be honest, Gilo Shiro has an amazing ability to survive anything. Um, really. She basically has the luck of goodness knows what. She's almost the opposite of War Spite in terms of survival. Um, and it's basically the odds scenario. A, the ones they build, in case of Yamato and Mushashi, they are built so big, so massive, they only manage to build two, and they can't really do much with them, because they're being held back for a decisive battle, because you can't afford, if you're the Japanese, to lose them in spoiling actions when you're outnumbered by that much versus the Americans. So the Americans are holding their capital ships back, so the Japanese respond by holding theirs back. This is one of the things that's often gone. If we talk about the Japanese holding their capital ships back and not doing much of them, well, the Americans are doing exactly the same. Why? Because the Americans lack the fleet oilers to send both them and the carriers forward. So they're holding them back. And so the Japanese are going, well, if their capital ships aren't coming out, why would we send our capital ships out to possibly be weeded out by lighter forces and then have to face their overwhelming numbers of capital ships? No, we're not going to do that. We're not stupid. So there are some legitimate reasons for it. Bismarck, etc. is just hilariously inefficient in design. But that's, again, if you think about that, go back to our earlier discussion we've had about how technology can be lost. And building an efficient capital ship is about more than what's written down, and about more than just the more than just the desire to build a capital ship. You've got the inefficiencies of the Weimar Republic slash Nazi state, compacted by the loss of institutional memory, the loss of learning, and attempt to rebuild this capability and build something bigger and better than you built before, and you have the Bismarck. Which is has some great paper stats. It would have raised costs, yes, if they're all getting refits. Um. Phew. So this canal has been expanded several times in history. Um, let's see.
I think it's been expanded, sort of broadly speaking. Ooh, timeline wise. I'm looking at the timeline for the dates. I think most of the expansions that we are talking about these days have taken more recently, taken place more recently, but there does seem to be some work in the 1920s and 30s, but I'm not sure if we call it an expansion or just a modification. And, yes, speaking of losing things in history, you also lost the capability to make nuclear weapons. I remember the comments. Closing production facilities in 1989, and the people who produced a uh, fob bank material that helps transfer energy from primary to secondary stage, or retired and moved on. Cost nearly 25 million, even with finding those still alive to ask questions. Mm hmm. Major element. And I'm a coach. The Amlin staff, yes. You know them, but you still don't. Not if they're. No, not if they are asking in December. It for extensions which are not on the papers which are due in March. No, they're not getting extensions. And um, if they need an extension and they have a legitimate reason in March, they'll get an extension. They're not getting... If they're asking now, they're not getting one. It's a case of, no, you've got months. You can work... You have time to work it out. I do understand you explain, but your points... Again... If anyone had given me a legitimate reason, I might well have gone... If someone said, I've got this sort of long-term commitment has suddenly turned up, which is going to affect my ability to work over the next few months. Yes. But mostly, I guess, are going, I'm not sure I will manage to get the work done on time because I'm going to be so busy teach, uh, doing my uh, doing the coursework in January. For that's due in January. So I might not get it ready for March. And I'm sort of guys going, you have February, and then you have March. And by the way, you had months beforehand. So... Part of the things we teach at university is organization skills. The lesson here is you should have started earlier. And always be nice to the admin staff, yes. Chocolates for them on a regular basis at Christmas. Exactly, Santa Canera. <laughs> I'll think about the brew crew scenario. Honestly, there is already some pretty decent merch, I think, down on the Spreadshirt shop, but I am considering putting in more and doing a bit more work there, because... Honestly, it's going to sound strange, but my approach to merch is I would love to be on level of the LTT store where, you know, you I can have control and I can be just as controlling as Linus when it comes to the quality of things. Um, or at least as he says he is. So far, considering what I've seen that I've got for family who are massive fans of his... It seems to be it seems to be quite true, but um, yeah, I'm not that kind of operation, so I ha I rely on Spreadshirt, who do a very good job and were recommended to me by Drac, and yeah, I like what they do. Was there a treaty reason for the UK not to macassar a 13 half inch dreadnought as a museum ship in Singapore, staffed by ex-Navy personnel, has some ammunition stored conveniently stored store nearby? Uh, the fact that they could actually build proper 15 inch fort guns and forts, because they were allowed to in Singapore, so that's what they did instead. The fact that they then didn't supply those 15 inch guns with enough ammunition, didn't build as many as they'd planned, and didn't build the secondary positions and other things around Singapore. Oh, yes. And forgot to reinforce, uh, to put some troops on the frigating reservoir that can try, despite having defense positions built to protect the reservoir, 
didn't send some troops to actually hold it, which allowed the Japanese to take it and cut off water. Yeah, the, the, there are many issues with Singapore. There are many is, 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 uh, interesting scenarios. Which one? You know, she was not that lucky to survive. What she wanted to do still got her. She sunk in 1955, probably due to a German mine left over from the war. Yes, but she survived while she was in Italian hands. There is Taranto, where you would, no matter how many scenarios I run, no matter what I do, no matter how many attacks, how many attacking aircraft I did, I did a simulation where there was 300 swordfish involved, which was theoretically impossible. It was actually impossible for the Royal Navy to mount in under any circumstance. And, um, still, not a single hit on her. I, I, she just, she just in, invincible. The other ships, the other capital ships, all look like pin cushions. They'd had so many torpedoes in them, but no, she survived. So, just have a look at Samaris. Looks very good. It is. Hammers. Our simple rockets like M26 for the MRS source hammers, very upgraded um, Grad Smirk rockets, are simpler and cheaper. To build than plain high explosive 155, 152 smiles. Not really, but we had the facilities already to build them already in place, and that is, that's the point. My personal wish, refloat nicer now and modernizer with triple 14 inch guns and 120 million dual purpose secretaries. I would need to keep Vanguard to keep Communist Party of Poland's flagship in check. That would be interesting. Doc, I do uh, Dick Richards. Doc, hey Doc, if you could have taken part in any battle in any unit of ship in actual history, which would be in why? Mine is with the Be uh, Beirut Dragons at Hoffenburg for obvious reasons. Um, Hoffenberg. Oh lord. Tribals at Narvik would be tempting. Swordfish at Taranto. Honestly, be tempted also by Repulse at under attack at force in force Z because she just does such amazing dodging. I just like to see that. Um Formidable at Matapan. I'd like to be on the gun crew that uh, I'd like to be part of the gun crew that decides they're gonna take part in firing on the cruisers. I just think that's cool. That's good. I got a rolling extension one year. Uh, admittedly, it, well, I was at uni in Manchester, and I had to be a, an executor on a complex one in London, so I think they were waiting uh, They were waiting for interruptions. You see, that's fine. If you were telling me that, that at this point, and saying I have this coming up, and that scenario, that would be understandable. You will get an extension. Just, I'm asking for an extension in Mar for the essay due in March, because I'm busy in January with the other essays, which are due for other modules. It's a case of, well, no... Now, remember, this question you'll probably hate. I doubt I will. The models exist. The general... The guided weapon missile cruisers take the place of the cannon class. What does that mean for Type 82s? Um, that means Type 82s are probably... If the county class are built as guided weapon missile cruisers instead, so they have 6-inch guns... Or maybe more, they possibly have six inch guns. Um, you might well see the Type 82 will be a cruiser rather than a destroyer. 
So the 42s would be built as the destroyer, the, the missile destroyer, and the 82s would be the replacement for the guided weapon cruisers. Thanks, Would you do any tours around Chant Dockyard or Portsmouth? Um, probably. If people wanted to go, let's put it this way: I wouldn't. Uh, my policy would always be, if it happens to be a day I'm free and I can be down there, and you're down there, and you want me to come along and say hi and show you a bit around, I'm happy to come do that. In case of if I'm free, I'm happy to do it. At the moment, I haven't got a car, so I'd probably go no. But when I have a car normally, I, I pop down the ports with often enough that frankly an extra day popping down there to go, hello, little, yeah, let's go around, I'd be happy to do so. Library of Congress does make a useful research and reference tool. So anyway, what did you use to simulate this, your 300 swordfish attack? Um, honestly, it's a variation on Harpoon. It's a mod which a friend of mine built for me. On Harpoon, which can allows me to put in World War II scenarios and build a full battle scenario. Cool. Glad to hear that, Leslie. We hear rain. Yes, it's now changed from snow to rain. Ah, so basically Italian version of New Zealand. I've shot over three Balakris and Warcrimes. No, no hits moving on to shooting something about divine protection. Always good. Shoot at the things which don't have divine protection. Yeah, I, I I think someone didn't like my man boobs apparently. On um, judging from the message deleted, didn't like my uh, on in hot top historian. Yeah, there's a few more of those coming. But you know, this is another reason I should go to the gym. If I'm going to carry on doing hot top historian, I need to make them make sure the um, top half is a little bit better than it is currently. This is what years of no gym versus year after years of gym do to you. You said I was talking with Dolan Freeman the other day, like, that was back at a conference, and the first conference I met him at, trust me, it was a big, big thing, and he's cool, he's cool, he still tells me, he, the last email contact I had, which was a while ago, I have to admit, it, I do owe him an email, um, I do owe him an email. He na he tells me off regularly about books I need to write. <laughs> I get this is big. I got I've got four professors who nag me about books I need to write, and I'm not writing a single one of the books they're telling me I have to write. <laughs> not fair. Well, people get just get heckled by one professor at most. I've got four. It's not fair. That does make me sound like a little kid. Sorry, I'll stop complaining about it now. But you know, I got. Four professors heckling me. Five, if you count my sister's old super PhD supervisor, who's a professor who's also adding suggestions for books I need to write. Sorry, I think my sister's ringing her phone, which is in her office next door. Sorry, I can hear my sister's phone going off the next door. I know where my sister is in the house. 
and I can hear it going off next door. So she, obviously she's ringing her phone, trying to find her phone, and it's behind me. Vanham, how much did room did do animals have for their staff on the command ship? It seems to me that they didn't have a lot of space, so fewer staff are not comparing to army air force. Yeah, it's grown over time. It's grown over time, but it can be up to a hundred or two hundred nowadays. But in the old days, it used to be it could be as little as a dozen. They really weren't a lot. Makuch, you can send a camera drone back in time for a bird's eye view and recording of any battle history. Which battle do you choose and why? Cape Economus. Which is... Quite possibly the largest naval battle of all time. I know there is Lake Pyong, Lake Pyong, which theoretically had eight hundred fifty thousand sailors and soldiers involved, but that's kind of an interesting scenario because, frankly, uh, that I'm not sure whether some of the soldiers included are actually part of land armies fighting, etc. And it's a it's a, it's a whole thing, that one. But, um... And also, that takes place on the 30th of August to the 4th of October. So, that to me... See, whereas Cape Economus takes place in one day, so there's 290,000 people fighting in one day, versus 850,000 over... over a month. 30th of August to 4th of October. That's the whole September's including that one. It, there's, there's something interesting going on there. So, Cape Economus. Um, Richard, the Barrier of Drones broke through and captured or rotated 66 enemy regiments themselves and took their flags and took 2,400 prisoners. Yeah, fun times. What is Harpoon? It's an old game. It's an old game, which is actually fairly decent for doing things like um, measured, rep repeatable, and replicable, repl replicable and repeatable testing of scenarios with pseudo mods on it. What happened to your car? Um, I had one car which was written off by the insurance company because it was involved in a very low speed crash where we were less than five miles an hour go traveling less than five miles an hour and I was pressing the brake and it didn't stop and there was found to be a fault with the car so whilst it was considered my fault for bashing it because I was in the car which hit the car in front it was considered mechanical failure not driver error so I got all the money for that and then I procured another car which came from Dealers with all the details, all the things saying it had just been for an MOT, everything was fine. And, um, well, as a result, I then, I waited though, before using it, because I'd just been through a car which had been accident mechanical error, and said, right, it's a Volvo, so I'll put in a few Volvo check. The Volvo people came back and said, we do not know how this passed its MOT. It is failing on this, 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 this category. So it went back to the dealer and went, I want my money back, please. And I just haven't managed to find what, uh, get a car, uh, find a car to buy since then. Because, of course, the market has gone up, shot up in price. And what was £1,000 is now five, £6,000. £6, and frankly, I'm not willing to pay that much for that car when it's not a good car. 
if you know what I mean. So, um, I'm kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because I'm in the transition economies and I'm signing new contracts, etc., for teaching all those things, and I'm just going. I don't have the money to pay for what I would equivalently normal buy, normally buy at the moment because it's quintupled in price. And I ain't buying what is currently in my price bracket. So I've been renting cars, which is also extortionate. Let me say, the top half is just fine. I think someone's projecting their personal problems onto you. Yeah. I don't mind. I've been called far worse. Represent Dr. Clark, nothing has divine prediction. Divine protection one sphere is blasphemy another. True, but I think there is a god of warships which does bestow on someone divine protection. It's either a god or a machine spirit. Your choice which one it is. Um, totaled is ri uh, written off. Basically, they decided to fix the radiator, etc. was too expensive to, uh, than to, re it was far more expensive to do than just write it off. Yeah, I have seen what happens to people who park their cars on, and when I go down to Portsmouth, I park my car in Gunmorph Keys. In the nicest way, that is the car park I go to. Mainly because two reasons. One, when I go to uh, when I go to Portsmouth, I go to uh, go around the historic dockyard. I come out. I visit the Cadbury's factory store. I pick up all the stuff which is from the Cadbury's factory store, which my family has sent me with a huge list for. I also tend to buy my shoes down there. But leaving that to one side, there is also a Chinese buffet, which is very very nice in there. I'll send them your way, Rapid Rays back. You, they can, you can have them nagging you rather than nagging me. <laughs> oh. So, it's idiotic to say that if you remove one miscommunication, the Israelis don't shoot down Libya, Boeing 727 out, and how friggin' angry would it be the world if Libya torpedoed the Queen of the Queen of the Second? Um, it's, that just sounds like history, and frankly, if the Libyans had torpedoed the QE2, they would probably have been facing the wrath of Umbai Kayar, and no one would have wanted to come and help them. That's just the fate, that's just what happens. So basically, Harpoon is a bit like Silent Killer. Another enterprise that was too realistic for masses. Harpoon is... As Steve Glass put, originally a tabletop design game designed by Larry Bond and then adapted into a PC game. It's got a lot of very good systems. But we really do need an upgraded version to start doing it, but to, to, to actually build, bring it into the current century, but it works quite well. And honestly, I am trying to figure out how to run it on the PC. In that this P the PC I built myself has been has got all the latest things on it that I could put on it, so I could have so it's really good and future proofed. But the trouble is because it's the next generation of beyond, it's also how do I put it? The old laptop I have, which I run Harpoon on, is not really suitable to keep running and is starting to die. And it's a laptop which literally exists to run Harpoon literally exists, so I need to I need to get it sort of more than upgrade a version of Harpoon to run on this computer. So, anyway, the Russian Empire in 1913 gets sent back to Rome time just before the Claudius Congress Britain. What do they send for naval diplomacy into the harbour of Rome? In 1913, I think... Um, I wouldn't be surprised if... Possibly. Just... Mm, more than like... Uh, possibly. 
Let's see, 1913. Available in 1913. Uh, won't be them. Uh, yes, I think in 1913 they would probably send uh, King George V with her very nice and very traditional armament of five twin 13 and a half inch guns to go and have a conversation with the Romans. I think the Romans might at that point possibly decide that there is a new god. The god would be King George V. It wouldn't be, uh, by the way, no, no, sorry. it would not be we have the, uh, a new god as in there is uh, the British are gods. No, no, no. It would be they would see that ship and go, that is, ne that is, I'm trying to remember, was it? it was Neptune, wasn't it? It was their version of Hades. No, Hades was another world. Neptune was the, uh, the, 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 the god of sea. The, 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 the Neptune? Yeah, I think it was. I'm gonna see what's brain is dying. I'm sure it's Neptune. Of the sea. Neptune. Yes, it was Neptune. Or Poseidon. Da, 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 da. It's a, a Greek one. Um, so they would have probably thought this, uh, that King George V was Neptune brought to life. Admittedly, they could have sent Orion, Conqueror, Monarch, and Thunder as well. Just send all five of them. Have you tried DOSBox? Um, not actually yet, no. Might do that. Unfortunately, Melanie, the uh, market went up just after I got paid. After all, the market was going up, so I got paid a bit more. But then the market went up there, and I was still I've been paid this amount. So I'm going to have to put in more money. And also I've had to use some money from somewhere to pay for the renting of the cars. Hopefully soonish. We all suffer from a lack of a Chinese buffet in our lives. A decent one. It always needs to be a decent one. I'm taking a battleship. And Austria is now to like 12 miles inland, maybe. But Austria was big enough that, frankly, it could have sat outside and gone, Hello. It might do. I'll have a look at it. But will it work with my with the mod? That's the trouble. Mm. Thanks, Fushi. Very kind of you. Well, the reason I wasn't sending HMS Neptune, and the reason I wasn't sending Neptune, is because whilst she is lovely, I personally don't like her because she's, of course, got those wing turrets, and we all know my view on wing turrets, and more importantly, she's only got 12 inch guns, so. You'd want to go with you sending your biggest and your best. And sending King George V also helps in that that's a representative of the King of England. It's actually named for the King. So it's kind of uh, helpful for diplomatic means. Because also the Romans might think you've actually sent their king there. The king there. That is the actual king. Uh, the ship is the king. Because honestly, let's be honest. If you're a Roman and you see HMS King George V turn up... That is going to look like magic. The fact it can spot a target a long way away and blow it up at range. That it can rapid fire puffs of smoke, boom, 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 and explosions shower all around it. That it can do all those things. That will look like magic. Admittedly, they'll immediately start analysing your magic and trying to work it out. But it will look like magic because it will be sufficiently advanced.
The journal's home, nothing better to do. Send everything. Eh, no, you, you, you probably need some in the channel to make sure the Romans don't try invading. Because does anyone want to actually send the territorial army to deal with the Roman army? In 1913. Oh, the Carthaginian, Carthaginian Roman first Punic the World Naval Battle. Damn. Finally found a battle. Thank you. The Battle of Cape Economus. It's a good battle. It is a good battle. Actually, the Vantanto Island is all the proof we need that the Romans would worship the warship King George V. Yeah. Uh, the rubber is, I don't know if you own wing turrets. I don't like wing turrets. I don't like them because, to me, they are a legacy of a poor design choice made by F Jackie Fisher, which he certainly agreed with as a poor choice. They are, especially when they're designed to fire across the ship, they're just going to wreck your ship and you don't actually want to do it. They give you a theoretical capability, which sounds great, but don't give you actual real capability. They have all sorts of trouble with aiming them because they're at different points of the ship. Whereas if you're on the center line, if you consider the ship's doing that, the center line stays, broadly speaking, in the same position. It tilts a little, but it's, it's broadly speaking, there's a sort of balance in the ship. And yes, the ship's do the fact the ship's doing all sort of that in through water is uh, always, uh, always a fun thing. But it's less affected if you're sitting on the center line. So it's easier for aiming and better. It's just... There's just so many issues, which frankly, centerline turrets better. Super firing centerline turrets, but I will take them. And it's the one thing. If I could go back in time and do anything to that sort of period, I would go to Jackie Fisher. I would tell him A, to fit triple turrets to Dreadnought, and B, super firing. It would be a case of, yes. Here is how we will make this ship really good. Oh, by the way, they will have 14-inch guns. It will have 15 of them, and it will be super firing. Boom, boom, boom. Five, tu five triple turrets. And then watch people get scared, because if you only build one of those, even if, by, the uh, by the time everyone else is going, Aah! just imagine, everyone at that, point, at that point had to develop the turbines, the ship, the armor, build it all, and also triple turrets and 14-inch guns. Because everyone else has got 12-inch, 12-inch, 11-inch guns. The Germans wouldn't be able to turn around and go, Well, really, our 11-inch gun is just as good as your 12-inch gun. Yes, but we have 14-inch guns. Well, our 11-inch gun is nowhere near your 14-inch gun. No, it's, it's just not, is it? No, no, no. Ellswick again? Yes, 14-inch guns. Thank you. And by the way, next generation will have 16-inch guns, or 16-inch 16, uh, 16 guns. And next generation of that will have 18-inch guns. Or maybe they'll have 15.5-inch guns, and then they'll have 17-inch guns. Who knows? That's what, sending a king to Republican Rome might not go down so well. It might make the point... Many children. How long will the 3,000 uh, tons of coal aboard King George V last? And once it's up, how will they handle refueling Roman times? Guessing they'd all have not all have oils to spray anymore. Well, considering those that coal, coal mostly came from Wales and it's 1913, Britain is taken back. They had still have all the infrastructure of Britain in 1913. So they would probably be fine. And Malta and Egypt part of the British Empire. Uh, yes, and also those are brother British holders. If it's the entire British Empire goes back in time, there's going to be a lot more than Rome that's going to be having a panic attack. There's going to be China. There's going to be uh, Persia is going to have a panic attack. Well, they're probably going to disappear, most of the Persian Empire at that point. Um, India. The, the whole world would be rebuilt. I mean, the advancement from the time of Fisher joining the Iran to his departure, pretty close to magic in terms of speed, I mean, frigate. Yep. Yeah. 
Let's run it. I'm always in two schools of thoughts about time travel. On one hand, I can seal the greatest name of battles, and on the other hand, I do not want to mess up history. That's why, really, you need some sort of spaceship to travel back in time so you can observe without, well, without interfering. Percy, you think they can manage triple turrets for dreadnoughts? Yep. Yeah, would it make sense for a naval aircraft or a passenger if they were lost to head for the coast? As that's what Libyan Airline, Arab Airlines 114 was trying to do for a shot. Well, if you're over water, yes. Because, let's be honest, if you're an aircraft, do you want to land on water or land? If you land on land, there might be an airfield somewhere nearby, or at least a road. <coughs> Malta doesn't have much of a Roman colony from memory, but I do think they do have something. If you had to choose between wing turrets and US double stacked 13 inch, 8 inch turrets, which would you go for? Why would you do that to me? Why? Why would we choose between that? You just, you just want to hurt me now. That's just cruel. It's, it's, uh, I've been on this live for four hours. Why ask me that cruel question? Captain C4, really? Yeah. If I have to choose, it's the 13-inch, 8-inch turrets, but I'd prefer to have, you know, Neva. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> the British Empire in 1915 goes back to the time of Rome. I think the British Empire of 1913 takes over the entire world. Because, let's be honest, who can stop them? And that's what if we consider all the diseases they bring back with them that they would have treatments for, but no one in that time would have treatments for. Because if you think about it, the British population in 1913 are the genetic descendants of those people who proved resistance to certain plagues, etc., that have ravaged the world prior to that. So they will be taking back all that genetic history in their DNA, but the people of the period don't have the genetic history in their DNA, whilst the people in 1913 will be bringing back the diseases with them. So, yeah. Earth suddenly becomes br the the London uh, the uh, the United well Earth will quickly become the Brit uh, the Great British Empire. Everywhere will be ruled from London. It'll be a United World Government. Or is it? Why did you not extend your book to discuss battles and learnings in Korea? Honestly, because once you get into the jet and missile age, it gets uh, more complicated. It did cover a bit of Korea, but not much, because that was also a problem with terms of getting into the archives at that time, and I wanted to do... There were limits, let's put it this way. Um, 1930 and Empire back there. So world population expanded like four times? Yep. But London doesn't exist yet. Well, it does in 1913 when it's sent back, doesn't it? As said, even the parts they don't conquer would probably die out, be impacted by diseases. So, yeah.
And as it's for as, and as it's now 11 o'clock with me, I'm going to say last questions, and then I'm going to finish for the evening. So, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for your super chats, and your subscri uh, subscribing, and your memberships, and super thanks, and all the support you give me. Because frankly, this... It's one of those things I, I, I know some people think I say too much, because I see some comments which go, Oh, you do labour this point, but it's very true. If you've not got a tenured post, the life for a naval academic, a naval historian or any historian or academic, is not very good. It's definitely not very stable. You lurch from well-paid job to well-paid job, but you have long periods in between of nothing. You kind of resemble an actor or an actress in that you sort of you can when you're working you can get paid quite well, but you're often not. And even when you are working, sometimes your employer forgets to pay you because they have, oh, you're a contract or short-term lecturer. And it's all sort of weird, and they're not sure what to pay you. And they get there's always an there's always a reason for why they've forgotten. But the thing I've noticed is that um, Patreon doesn't forget; they pay you on the same day. You don't always, oh, you know, it's it's not a earth-shattering amounts of money. It's a lot for me. I don't want people to think that I'm living on caviar and all the things thanks to that. I, I, I wish. Actually, no, I don't. I don't like caviar. I tried it once at a party. It was really her terrible. Give me a burger any day of the week. Far more than caviar. Ugh. But um, leaving that to one side, but it really makes a big difference to me because it's a consistent income and it's the same with YouTube. It's a consistent income. It's it's support. It's something that I can base things around. And, you know, the funding I got last year was a massive difference to the trip to Canada. This year, it looks like I'm waiting for next week to find out for sure, but I'm fairly certain the only source of funding I'm going to have for this year's research, for Australia, etc., which is why I'm working out and being, being sort of slow on some of the things, is going to be what I can earn through work and what the generosity of my support, those who support me and support me doing the history because I don't think I'm going to qualify for the funding. Mainly because I qualified for a large chunk of funding last year, which was nice. It helped. It, it basically... Mm, not quite as much as the support that came from YouTube for the trip to Canada, but a healthy sum which helped with the costs of getting the equipment and sorting everything out and and putting everything together to go and getting all the visas and all the details and all the things for the um, museums. And yeah, it wouldn't be possible without you. So thank you. You've made a big difference. And especially at this point of the year, when I'm looking back and looking at my taxes and taxes and arranging all that, I realise how much of a big difference you've made. Because when I'm putting down my monthly income, I actually have a monthly income, which is every month there is a figure coming in. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's it's it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's been that way now for a couple of years, thanks to all of you. But it's it's um it's still a bit shocking sometimes. All right. Sig luck, but if Rome ceases to exist, Rome can't create London. But if R London is already back in time in 1913, it becomes a whole sort of interesting point. But Rome didn't create London. One of the things that are interesting to forgot is that there was a settlement on London before Rome got there. It's a natural crossing point on the Thames. It's there's always a settlement. As, for example, as Wellington famous pointed out one of his battles in India. He saw there was a village on one side of the river, a village on the other side of the river. And he was told by everyone, no, there's no ford there, there's no ford there. He went, there is never going to be a scenario where there is a river between two villages and they are opposite on the opposite sides of the bank and there is not a ford or something connecting them. We will go and find the ford. Nice hearing. Why is alt history so difficult in certain areas? Because you wander off into complete fantasy land. 
and at the, beyond a certain point you wander off into fantasy land and that is difficult to do it's better it basically you change from having to have a historian's analytical approach to having more of a fiction writer approach because you have to because you have to fill in so many gaps with things you can't things you don't know so you have to fill in those gaps otherwise you can't do anything They would also have to know where in the world all the resources they needed were. Yep, yeah, but again, the British Empire in 1913 pretty much has a good idea of where those are. And think of it, they've gone back in time and all the environment hasn't been as, uh, isn't as badly damaged as it already has. Thank you, Serenity Zen. Thank you, Megastro. Thank you, Richards. Thank you, Anuk. Thank you, Nice Excited for One. Thank you, Rapid Race Back. Thank you, my admins this evening, which were Dan... Uh, Senna Canero, Melanie1640, Stafford, of course. Um, I think Senna Canero has been the one, uh, has been the champion this evening for basically knocking people out on the chat. So thank you for the protection. I would suggest they pay you money. I I tried to persuade them this idea. Thank you, Josh Funk. Thank you, DJ40. Uh, thank you, Stafford. Thank you, Rapid Razor. Thank you, HRS Verdun. University not paying enough for people is shocking, given the answer to the size. Um, let's put it this way. I've have, I often have a discussion with students, and they try and think, they think because they pay so much fees that the lecturer is paid a lot of money, and I go, no. And it really isn't the case that the lecturer earns a lot of money. Fishing for grant money has to be soul sucking. It comes with. Uh, I am also. I am bad with grants because um, I am quite selective of what I apply for. Uh, the ones which come with too many strings, I don't apply for. I am very selective in terms of... My view is, if you'll give me money to go and do a research project, that's great. And I will happily take that. I will give you the research project that I'm doing, and if you want to fund that, that's brilliant. But if you come back to me and go, I want to make these changes, these changes, this, 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 I go, no, thank you. Because I'm a doing this project because it's what the history I think needs to be done and that's not the financially sensible route I do realize that that's not the financially sensible route I have a policy when it comes to teaching if you what the course you want me to teach I will turn up and teach I'm happy to do that you give me your course notes I will turn up and teach them but if I'm doing my research if it's something I'm going to put my name to and publish it's going to be what I agree with and what I believe They challenge it. Secret tip, if you want a steamboat ride, you should check out the resin now. And I'll vote for I will do. Thank you, H. Rosalan. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I think Drac is the dark overlord of naval history. I'm I'm going to go for I am the weird jester of naval history at some point. I'm probably going to regret those words someday, but hey-ho. Take care, Richard. Take it on George Newman. Thank you, Dirt Squad. Thank you, Thomas Vanderbilt. Thank you, Tanya Felica. Thank you, Rapper Ezek. Thank you, Anuk. Thank you, Steve Clark. Cam Seaforth. In 7906. Or... Hmm. Thank you, Fuji Smith. Thank you, Jack Ray. And also adminning Jack Ray. I forgot that for a second. You've been quiet for a while, so I forgot you've been adminning as well. Thank you, everyone. Take care and have fun. Make sure that's in live chat before I go. Take care. Toodles. Thank you, Darius Rowski. Thank you, Just Funk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care.